Hello everyone, my name is Julia Dominiak and today I'm going to share with you the result of our work on robot-based system for quasi-direct interaction with unpleasant creatures. This project was held by Lutz University Technology in Poland. Nowadays, robots have been many applications in the field of medicine, but most of them do not support the therapy of psychological disorders. Phobias affect a very, very large percent of society in case of fear spiders, touch from 3.5 to 6.1 percent of people. Therapies can be divided into two main approaches, gradual exposure or shock therapy. So far, the use of VR technology has been studied for both types. However, the transition before virtual and real world in therapy is still a challenging step. Our solution is a response to the need of an intermediate stage of treatment to enable smooth and adjusted turn toward more real stimuli. In order to probe the opinion of potential user and elicit usability requirements, we conduct a pre-study experiment using a proof-of-concept prototype. We arrange an interactive therapy workstation equipment with a large terrarium in which the robotic system and the artificial spider were settled. The prototype enabled funding and poking at the artificial spider. The first version had only three joints. The study involved 15 participants who did not have spider phobia but felt uncomfortable in a proximity of spiders to avoid strong anxiety reaction. We qualified that using the fear of spider questionnaire. Conversation with users and therapists allow us to determine the potential of the device and the necessary changes to ensure the comfort of use and improve the immersion experience. To address this, we designed a constructed a gesture driven robotic manipulator providing tangible haptic experience for therapeutic use. The manipulator imitates the operator movement by mapping four degrees of freedom, elbow flexion, hand rotation, wrist horizontal and vertical movement. Moreover, the robotic arm has the hand shape effector with three mobile fingers, which are also mirroring patient moves. The construction of the manipulator is mainly based on 3D printing technology. The elements have been divided among themselves according to the type of filament. The first group are elements made of standard rigid materials. In our case was PLA and ABS. It consists of nine arms elements and nine phalangeal bones, proximal and intermediate in a hand shape effect. The next category is the finger joints made by elastic materials, hardness of 30D in short scale. Fancy of these elements allows the effector to move. The last so sort of material is conductive PLA. The distal phalanges and the spider model are printed from it. This provides the ability to detect the contact of the manipulator and the phobic object. The 3D models of the elements comprising for the arm have been designed using Autodesk Fusion 360 and printed using consumer and 3D printers such as Zortrax M200 for standard materials and Ender 3 for flex and conductive materials. The robotic arm is driven by a total of seven servo mechanisms, four of standard size and three micro servos. Two servo driver Adafruit controllers are used to set position of all motors. 
Six ESP type microcontrollers coordinate the collection of data from sensor, activation of vibration motor, transition via Wi Fi standard, and setting the position of servos. On the side of the user control interface are three ESP8266, which are assembly on custom made PCB. On the side of the robotic arm are two. ESP8266 and one ESP32 with a built-in touch sensor. Microcontrollers with servo drivers are mounted on a custom pad designed for 3D printing. To control the manipulator, the users put on elastic glove and elbow band and two straps in the middle of forearm. They are needed in order to install the appropriate sensor and motors. The set includes five vibration motors on the bottom of flanges and gyroscope mounted above the wrist. Four one-axis sensor that mapping the movement on, of the finger and flex elbow and one two-axis sensor located on the wrist. In the first version of the prototype, the EMG sensors used required individual calibration before each use, which caused problem with scalability and easy of use. The upgraded approach is based on using a gyroscope and, and two axis flex sensor that do not require calibration. The remaining sensors are single axis flex sensor, applying various varying resistance to measure the angular flex. According to the validation study, calibration is advisable every one to two weeks of intensive use. In order to simplify the calibration procedure, we develop a calibration protocol. This operation is performed through fine-tuning the voltage divider circuit response for supplying analog signal to the microcontroller. And an important element of the procedure is the design and use of 3D printouts in the form of calibration tunnels, allowing for the repeatable deflation of the sensor at angle of 90 degrees. I will study on the dependence of the analog signal value and resistance of potentiometer in the voltage divider circuit during a band from 0 to 9 degree, 90 degrees confirm the linearity of the sensor and proved rep replicable. The experiment was also carried out over a long period of time, which allowed to determine the suggested time intervals between subsequent calibration. <clears throat> In order to provide partial immersion to the patient, we implemented remote touch function, which are support, supported using conductive sensor. Fingertips when, uh, printed with conductive filaments act as probe for touch recognition. Therefore, it, it becomes critical to accurately define measurement threshold for each finger to ensure smooth and consistent feedback pattern. Since each fingertip differs in size, finding individual correction coefficient was necessary. In this case, each finger's finger was tested under different pressure to establish the threshold value. In order to create a correct haptic response, the range of uh, vibration force was mapped using free range of touch, non-delicate and strong. The use of Wi-Fi communication between the controller and the manipulator simplifies the connection process and eliminates unnecessary wiring. Along with the convenience of wireless communication, there comes the latency. In order to make sure that the, that the delays value I will not be annoying to the user, both the lack of the servos and the vibration motor were, test, were tested. Latency insufficiently constant for all system function 
allowing to easily perceive the state of the system and predict what will happen while being low enough not to irritating the user. In conclusion, we present the design, implementation and formal evaluation of Spider Hand, interactive robot-based system designed to, to add arachnophobia therapy. <clears throat> this system was designed in a process involving expert therapies and press study with potential user. This approach enables us to explore the dam of technology supported psychological therapy and to elicit the system requirements straight from strengthholds. Our work con contributes to human robot interaction by providing insights of designing robotics for adding psych psychological treatment procedure. We showed that low-cost DIY robotics can be successfully employed in medical context while preserving high movement replication accuracy. We commit our prototype as an implementation toolkit for swift replication and using our solution in future research. Hello and welcome to my presentation for UV Interact. In the next few minutes, I want to give you a quick overview of what UV Interact is and how it works, so you can see for yourself whether it might be something useful to you. So, what is UV Interact? Um, in essence, it's a framework for building distributed and interactive applications. The initial motivation for UV Interact came from several fields in HCI. Uh, for example, uh, building virtual, augmented, or mixed reality applications using smart devices with these applications, um, using it in combination with simulation engines like robotics, um, the Internet of Things as an emerging field, web application that you want to integrate, different game engines. Maybe it's even something more experimental, like your own laboratory prototype, um, an EMG or EG device, or maybe something that the future will bring. With all these different systems and devices, of course, comes a lot of standards, SDKs, APIs, and so on. So the ultimate goal of Uber Interact is to allow to build applications involving any of these devices or systems while they are either distributed over a network and or running within their own individual processes. We then want to explore their combined possibilities and potential new use cases with new ways of interacting between each other. For interactive applications, this would typically mean local networks. Since we're also incorporating web technologies, we're not limited to local though. In the end, Ube Interact was not designed with a specific field in mind though, but it was meant to be used in whatever context it proves to be useful. So we want all of these individual environments to be able to communicate with each other and combine them into one big distributed application which also means including all of new devices in the future, as well as being able to handle similar devices interchangeably. This should prove especially useful when building your own prototypes. When we develop these connected systems, ideally we would like to be able to implement some of our system behavior or interactivity between the single components in a way that lets us reuse them in case the next application context slightly changes instead of re-implementing parts of our established code. For example, when we switch from Unreal Engine to Unity. Or maybe there already is a piece of code that would solve our particular problem, but it's written in a different language than our primary system, or we can execute it on our particular device. In these cases, we'd like to have a little black box of functionality, which we can run in its native environment and have to communicate with the rest of the distributed system. And, of course, all of this should be happening with enough performance for real-time applications. Let's take a closer look at the system architecture then. Overall, Uber Interact is a centralized architecture with several client nodes and a single master node that handles services and data distribution. The outer blue circle represents the messaging layer of your data producers and consumers sending and retrieving data on topics via typical publish-subscribe pattern. Each of them would run a UV Interact client node fitting their particular environment. 
clients can choose to connect using either zero MQ and or HTTP requests and uh, web sockets. To provide a common language between all participants, we rely on Google protocol buffers to define extendable message formats and provide performance serialization. With this, you could use UbiInteract as a simple communication framework, providing message formats and several connection services, and leave it at that. To give a quick overview of how clients would connect to our master node, each client implements a synchronous and an asynchronous connection. For our synchronous connection, we can choose between ZNQ's request with PyPlatin or HTTP requests. For our asynchronous connection, we pick either ZNQ's with a dealer pattern or WebSockets. This should allow us to implement client nodes on almost any device. All initialization and configuration is then obviously handled through the synchronous connection, while all live data is transferred over the asynchronous connection. But what if you want to integrate a device that brings its own ready-to-use interface or won't allow running a Uvintra client node on it? Or you want to do a bit more with the data, like mapping, transforming, analyzing, and processing it independently of which and how many clients are currently present at runtime. In this case, uh, processing modules, and in the paper you'll find them still referred to as interactions, can perform tasks and react to everything going on in the messaging layer. They can also serve as a communication and state manager for your standalone IoT device or simulation suit that has its own interfaces and API. They're represented inside the red inner circle and would typically run on the same machine as the master node. Processing modules would also be our entry point to integrate external libraries into our system, sort of following the dream of the Lego pieces that we can put together to build our applications. Sessions are used to instantiate these processing modules and give them their runtime environment and control their execution flow. Unraveling the processing module package a bit further, we can see that a processing module is simply defined by its inputs and outputs, again based on the same protobuf message formats that we use for our client communication. A processing module has access to external libraries and defines some common lifecycle functions like on-processing or on-created uh, for a session to be able to steal its execution. Apart from that, it uses its own internal naming convention, so you're free to write it in a true modular fashion. As we want to guarantee modularity and reuse our modules in different contexts, a session includes a mapping between topics, i.e. client data, and the internal input-output specification of a processing module. The common message formats guarantee consistency between the two endpoints. That way, a processing module that, for example, performs object recognition via a TensorFlow network can be agnostic to who provides the image data and simply output its recognized classes, which in turn can be used by whoever is interested. Looking at our clients a little more in depth, UbiDirect provides some help with specifications to better organize the different data consuming and producing elements. A client can specify devices, which in turn contain components. A component would directly relate to a specific topic, a message format uh, for the topic, and whether it produces or consumes data. While a device is more abstract and bundling different components, it doesn't necessarily relate to an actual physical device. This organization into devices and components isn't enforced, though. A client can simply start publishing or subscribing to topics. Now let's look at another scenario where we have an unknown number of clients that all have similar interfaces, but we don't know how many there are. However, we have a processing module that wants to handle all of them and in relation to each other. For these cases, UbiInteract offers the concept of topic multiplexer and demultiplexer. A multiplexer would gather all topics based on a certain regular expression, then pass it on as a list to our processing module. Our processing module can then go through all the entries, then produce the desired output in reference to the identifiers the topic multiplexer passed along, and the demultiplexer would then be able to, based on IDs, uh, produce 
topic pattern outputs uh, for each desired smartphone. Now let's check out some demonstrators and applications that have been using UV Direct so far. In this video, you can see me demonstrating the example from before where a processor module is performing 2D object detection using TensorFlow. Here you can see a little game we call UV Party, where people can use their personal smartphones to hop in and out of games between short rounds of minigame sessions. This served as a first test environment to check the system's capabilities for ad hoc handling of clients joining and leaving at runtime, and also to evaluate latency, as reaction-based video games will certainly reveal any shortcomings in that regard. In this simple demonstrator, we combined a VR HMD together with a smartphone to perform raycast object selection. In this project, UV Interact was used in comparison to uh, Unity's open source mirror networking solution um, to build a platform for superhuman sports games. There's also applications from the field of serious games trying to combine entertainment with teaching. They use UV Interact for implementation of their multiplayer modes or, for example, uh, interactively painting a sculpture in a museum by using a smart device uh, combined with a projector. Uber Interact also comes with a web frontend that provides some tools ready to use interfaces or demo applications. Here we have a very simple demo demonstrating how to publish and subscribe as a client. Our topic data inspector will give you a live reflection of all the data that is being communicated. So how does UV Interact actually perform? If you're inclined to try UV Interact for yourself, uh, you can always use the web frontend's performance test tools to do your own round-trip time testing. Apart from that, the Superhuman Sports platform um, that we saw earlier that is uh, comparing mirror networking to UV Interact found them both to be roughly equal in speed, although on a very small scale, net mirror networking is supposed to be scaling up to MMO levels. Below, you can see a table of round-trip time tests we did with the web frontend um, in different scenarios, for example, localhost, then over the local network, either as desktop or smartphone, and then uh, connecting uh, from our UV server that was located 20, around 20 kilometers away from our uh, university VPN network uh, to a client that was uh, roughly 30 kilometers away in a different direction. For the future, we first plan to implement more clients. Currently, there's only JavaScript and C Sharp. Uh, C++ client is almost done. We have the service and topic data connections established. It's only about refactoring and finalizing the code. Secondly, we want to finalize the possibilities for clients to run processing modules. This would enable clients to provide capabilities to other participants, as well as run separate processes on the master node that um, implement processing module in different languages. Then thirdly, we also want to implement more automated inferencing, introspection, and debugging tools for sessions. If you feel like this is interesting to you, you can find the whole project as open source on GitHub. And if you have further questions, you can always email me. And with that, I want to thank you for listening. And also, I want to thank my colleagues for adopting UV Interact so quickly and trying things out and testing with me. I hope to meet some of you during the conference and maybe discuss a little bit. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Jorge Cardoso and I'm from the University of Coimbra in Portugal. And I'll present a VR book, a tangible interface for smartphone-based virtual reality. I'll start by motivating this work and then describing uh, the, the prototypes that we implemented uh, and then talking a bit about the evaluation and finally concluding. So uh, we all know that interaction in virtual reality is still mostly accomplished through handheld controllers, which essentially impose rather arbitrary mappings between users' actions in the physical environment and the associated system's response in the virtual environment. Controllers also provide a low-quality haptic experience because users are constantly grabbing the same physical object, regardless of the virtual object being manipulated. This makes interaction harder to learn. Of course, there are now various virtual reality systems that, that detect users' hands and allow for gestural interaction, but you still get no haptics and gestures may still be hard to learn and to perform. Being able to physically touch and feel an object is important, even in VR. In this work, we are interested in tangible interaction for virtual reality because it can naturally provide this haptic experience. In addition, we are interested in tangibles that are easy to create, cheap and accessible to anyone. We are further interested in creating virtual reality systems for exploring architectural heritage. In a different project, we are developing a virtual reconstruction of a monastery as it was in 1834, and we want the output of that project to be accessible to non-professionals in a walk-up and use scenario, such as a museum or during a guided tour. In these situations, people usually don't have the time to learn how to use the system, and they may have little previous experience with virtual reality. So we started to explore marker-based passive tangibles that could be used in smartphone-based virtual reality and be detected by the smartphone's camera. These tangibles don't need any additional hardware and they are fairly easy and cheap to create. We started by mapping out a design space for marker-based tangibles for virtual reality that could help us understand the design dimensions that we could then explore. We did this by analyzing the literature on tangibles in virtual reality, by developing several prototypes to better understand what would be possible and what would not be possible, and also by running ideation sessions with other people to get additional perspectives on how tangibles could be used in virtual reality. We ended up creating a design space with eight dimensions. The overall fidelity dimension captures part of the layered model of substitutional reality by Simeone et al. But we simplified it by considering only two options. Replica, which represents a reproduction of a specific actual object and proxy, which includes all other objects which only maintain some characteristic of an actual object. The main physical characteristic dimension captures the most relevant feature the designer is trying to convey. It could be shape, the rigidity, the weight, the texture, temperature or even smell of uh, an actual object. The main input-output role dimension represents whether the tangible has a more relevant function as an input or as an output. The output modality dimension refers to how the tangible is represented in the virtual environment. The output coupling dimension refers to whether information is displayed on the surface of the object itself, 
whether it somehow it is somehow coupled to the object but not displayed on the surface or whether the information is displayed in the environment and completely decoupled from the object. The type of object dimension captures several possible properties of the physical object, such as being movable, uh, being reconfigurable, being active or passive, or being a static or dynamic object. The system configuration dimension is taken directly from Ulmer and Ishii's categories of tangible uh, systems and represents how tangibles relate to one another in a system of tangibles. Finally, the informational role dimension is equivalent to Holmquist et al.'s classes of physical objects that represent digital information and this can be a container, a token or a tool. We eventually settled on the form of a book for tangible uh, interaction because it is a familiar object that can be used inconspicuously anywhere. We created several prototypes, but essentially the book is composed of a few cardboard pages with visual markers to identify the pages. Some pages may have additional markers for interactive features, such as portals or slides, for example. For the implementation, we used the A-Frame web-based virtual reality framework and the ARJS component for detection of markers. In a first prototype, uh, we focused on simple page flipping interactions, where users could essentially flip the pages to see the contents. In some pages, there were videos that would play automatically as the page was opened. We also added portals that users could go through by moving the book towards their eyes. In a second prototype, we explored gaze-based interactions, where some elements on pages could be activated by gazing at, at them for a few milliseconds. For example, one page displays the tower of the University of Coimbra, and you can hear the bell ring when you gaze at the tower. In another page, there is a map with pop-up pins that you can gaze at to display photos associated with that location on the next page. In another page, there's a video and you can select the, the narrator's language by gazing at a menu on the left side page. In a final prototype, we tried to push a bit more on the limits of what we had implemented before. And this prototype was implemented after user feedback that I will describe later. Uh, as a very simple way to represent virtual hands, we applied markers on the hands of the user. We also implemented content browsing with a gesture slider where users would make a sliding gesture over markers on the bottom of the page. We also implemented a tangible slider where users would physically pull a strip to move through page content. We also implemented a variation on the portals. Uh, so we implemented detachable portals. And these were markers that could be detached from the book and brought closer. Our evaluation was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic so we could not gather people in our lab to perform usability evaluations. So we had to think of an alternative form of user evaluation that could be performed from participants' homes. And in addition, we wanted to avoid having to share the book's prototypes between different participants. So we eventually settled on having an online questionnaire where participants would see various videos of one of the authors using the prototypes. 
In this evaluation, we were interested in knowing what participants expected to see in terms of content on the book, but also on how they expected to be able to interact with it. We also wanted to gather specific feedback regarding the prototype number one. Uh, and finally, we wanted to know their overall impression on the idea of the virtual reality book. We were able to gather 21 participants aged from 20 to 52 years old. Most of them were men. And the output of this evaluation was essentially qualitative data that we then analyzed and summarized. So I, I will next highlight the most salient issues. To one's eye to enter the portal. About the expectations regarding content and interactions, many participants mentioned it would be interesting to have dynamic content on the book's cover, uh, for example, video and animation. Uh, one participant, for example, mentioned it would be interesting to have the author of the, of the book presenting the book itself on, on a video. One participant mentioned it would be useful to display content outside the book in the environment and we actually explored this in the third prototype, but we did not assess this feature yet. There were also suggestions about having different ways to control video reproduction with gestures, touch and even voice commands. One participant mentioned an interesting idea of shaking the book to change the video, for example, and this interaction could probably be uh, <clears throat> used uh, in other interactive features. Another idea was to have touchable areas in the book to trigger interactions. About the specific feedback for prototype number one, participants identified a few issues we were already aware, such as errors in marker detection and graphical layout and rendering problems. They also mentioned that the portal feature was not clear. Uh, we implemented the portal in prototype number one as a Smith sphere on the book's page, but this was not clear as to what it meant. One particip participant mentioned that the scenario was distracting, uh, but other participants highlighted the relevance of having 360 photos or videos related to the book's content. They also mentioned that vi viewing the video might be uncomfortable if the video was very long. We believe that some of these misunderstandings uh, that result, result from the fact that participants did not experience the system firsthand. Regarding the overall impression, it was quite positive. So 20 participants said that they liked or liked very much the prototypes and some participants even included positive comments highlighting how this kind of interaction was very interesting to them. Only one participant said he disliked the idea and saw no purpose in having a tangible VR book. So in this work, we started to explore the design space of marker-based tangible interaction for virtual reality. We began with the book format because we believe it is a useful form factor that can have many different applications, but we wish to explore other formats as well. Marker-based tangible interaction is a cheap and accessible solution for smartphone-based VR. And we, of course, acknowledge the limitations of our uh, evaluation, of our initial evaluation, but we still believe that the results are promising and worth uh, continuing uh, this line of work. Hi everyone, my name is Junaid Yunus. I'm a PhD student at Technical University of Kaiserslautern and I'm here to present our paper Finger Rewriting Movement Reconstruction with Low Cost IMU Sensor on behalf of my co authors, Hector Margarito, Shizan Pian, and our supervisor, Professor Dr. Paul Lukovic. 
In today's pre uh, presentation, I will introduce you to the finger ear writing system, the problem we address and the motivation to address that so, uh, problem and the contribution we made in this work. Then I'll explain of the design of the finger wand sensor which tracks and records the finger movement in air and followed by a trajectory reconstruction method which reconstructs the finger movement from imaginary can canvas and projects into a 2D screen in real time then a graphical user interface to interact with the developed system we all also talk about the data collection by using finger wand system then I'll talk about the human based evaluation we made to establish the usability of the system finally I'll summarize the system with a hint toward the future work <coughs> to start with on the larger scope the vision is to develop a system which enables the end user to write in an ear without requiring any reference surface on an imaginary canvas with your finger and requiring without requiring any extra apparatus which limits the mobility or the scope of the system like cameras and other things for example in current scenario when I am presenting this uh, a paper here the more normal way I if I want to explain something I will try to do the movement with my finger so the finger base system are very very make it's very natural to develop a finger wand finger movement system to add or write something here to highlight something here and for example another use case would be in office environment if I want to meet a colleague to discuss some important thing and he is not available I can simply write on his door and attach that note virtually so when he's in office he gets a notification on his mobile or on his display so that he can contact me back so the problem we address here is the finger ear writing system to extract the casual finger motion and project it onto a 2d screen in real time so we do it by are using a simple sensor fusion algorithm by using a single IMU without any reference surface on an imaginary canvas the problem with the using IMU is their vulnerability to the noise or internal sensor error which leads to the drift and which accumulates over the time uh, uh, over the time and results in accuracies even in position tracking and when it comes to handwriting which involves the interperson intraperson variations even so the task becomes even harder so we <coughs> as we talk we also compensate uh, diversity in human writing to make it usable in generic scenario the motivation is to write the piece of documents piece of text whenever and wherever the user wants this enables the user to create the document in virtual and augmented reality by just using your finger movement and to provide a visual feedback of your finger movement or it's a realistic visual feedback is also needed so we also uh, don't want to add any additional component uh, equipment which limits the scope of the system deployment the contribution we made during this work uh, is a system finger wand sy system variable says it's a finger variable sensor which tracks and records the finger movement and then our trajectory reconstruction algorithm it is based on a simple sensor fusion algorithm to reconstruct that finger movement and we collect the data using finger ear writing system 
on the basis of data collection we made a preliminary evaluation based on human uh, to establish the degree of readability on the left side we can see the finger bone system in work and on the right side the graphical user interface shows the real time results and other information now i'll talk about the design of finger a uh, finger a writing system here it's uh, on uh, it's the overview of the finger a writing system there are two parts which are separated by the dotted line above part is the hardware line which is your on your finger which collects the, uh, uses the imu to collect the data of the finger movement and processes it and transmit it via bluetooth to the remote system where system processes it to reconstruct the trajectory <coughs> the finger one sensor is, uh, is built uh, in our group by our co-author Shazan Bian which uses the Ardo Fruit, Ardo, 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 Ardo Tunio Pro Mini and RN42 Bluetooth to transmit the data so what the finger uh, uh, the, the data rate of the finger one sensor is 30 megahertz uh, it processes that co collects the data from accelerometer gyroscope magnetometer add it adds the timestamp to it and transmits to remote system via bluetooth once the data is transmitted to the remote system then on the other uh, on that side the data is processed so that it can be visualized on the screen in the real time once the, 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 once the data is collected we apply a sensor simple sensor fusion uh, method which converts the uh, coordinates into real world coordinates Cartesian coordinates x y z and then projects it onto the screen the visualize uh, who use the orientation angles to convert the data to uh, reconstruct the trajectory of the finger movement, which is based on the Madwix theorem. Uh, who uh, use the gyroscope information to change the direction of the angles and then accelerometers are used to estimate the drift and compensate for it <coughs> so after sensor fusion we get the roll pitch and gap which is for the process to get x y and z component in real time and real world coordinates once we get the real world coordinates every users had different hand movements and different writing styles and different variations even within the person so to interpret that movement on the screen so that those move variations can be compensated we calculate the x and y gain and then we uh, track the angle change which for and compare it to the last sample collected and then after getting that difference we trace that difference on the screen for the real-time visualization we also develop a simple graphic user interface uh, which enables the user to uh, not only the information which doesn't only show the information but also enable them for user to uh, communicate or to interact with the finger wall sensor so what it uh, uh, on the number one it shows the samples collected Num on the number two the, the real-time trajectory reconstruction is shown on number three raw signal data is shown number four the calibration data is, is shown and number five one this is the menu which enables the user to interact with the system like connect record stop disconnect and save the data uh, here uh, i explain the working of the 
system or the graphical user interface like when the system is initialized it's in ideal stage when it is connected to the uh, system connected to the finger wand, uh, finger wand sensor then it's always listening once we press the record it start the sample recording and once the sample is recorded it processes the data and saves the data in the directory here in this video i'll present uh, show you a small video uh, which shows how the graphical user interface work and how the trajectories are reconstructed like once we connect the system then we press the record and then it will start the recording when stop it stops the recording and we can simply disconnect the device after that when we want to start a new recording we can simply if we set the log name whatever the files and the file is stored in the root directory and then start stop and by recentering it will remove the data and <coughs> the canvas is new canvas is appear on the screen so after graphical user interface i'll uh, talk about the data collection we uh, collected the data from about 20 participants out of which 11 were males and 9 were females who took part in these studies they were mostly were the students from technical university of kaiser lawton whose age range varies from 20 years to 35 years they all belong to different geographical regions like mexico germany colombia croatia ecuador and Peru. every two incorporate interperson uh, handwriting variation we asked we recorded the data for five cycle uh, for every sample five times which include the numerals from zero to nine uppercase letters a to z and lowercase letter a to z at the end from 20 participant after pre-processing who were able to collect five and of thousand two hundred and seventy samples of the data <coughs> on this slide i'll show you uh, the numbers from zero to nine with labels elements uh, zero to nine and a to z and how they look like after the tra trajectory reconstruction so as i talk uh, the results we present here are based on human evaluation after the data was collected the user the participants were shown some random numbers and asked to recognize what appears on the screen so the numerics and uppercase letters were uh, <coughs> recognized better than the lowercase letters. We also uh, asked users to rate the trajectory reconstruction as good, normal and bad. And as a result shows that we achieve a high degree of variability because most of the time the trajectory reconstruction was labeled as good in some cases it was normal and in very few cases it was it was labeled as bad here are the examples of some samples for numerals lowercase letters and uppercase letters which are labeled as good in blue color which uh, and the reconstruction which were labeled as normal are highlighted with green color are reconstructed with the green color the bad ones are highlighted with purple color and at the end on the lower end with the black ones are were titled as unrecognized were not recognized by the users so there are also we show some failed examples like five and eight were not recognized in the numbers e and f as a capital letters i and j 
the mostly the numbers um, the system fails when the, we have very low uh, very few data samples or when we have a <coughs> complex structure to write and so finally in summary we introduce a finger ear writing system which enables the user to write in air using a single low-cost IMU sensor we also develop a trajectory reconstruction method which is based on a simple sensor fusion algorithms and achieves a high degree of human readability with real-time feedback we also presented a graphical user interface to interact with our system we have collected data from multiple participants to incorporate inter and intraperson handwriting variability we also did the human based evaluation to establish the utility of the system in generic scenarios as a future work we want to we will recommend to increase the autonomy of the finger bone sensor like by adding push to write feature and or we can also implement some software mechanism based on deep learning to detect whether the person is writing or not and the data will be automatically recorded when the person is writing we can also use, we also propose to use deep learning and machine learning methods to classify and recognize the written letters and numerals we also propose that to use computer vision methods to compose the words out of sing out of singly written characters thank you very much for listening if you have any questions Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present our paper, LAMR, a lighter based adaptive multi inhabitant activity recognition. I am presenting Muhammad Ariful Alam. I'm an assistant professor in computer science, University of Massachusetts Law. So, the LIDAR is a light detection and ranging sensor that is mostly used in automated car, and it can generate this kind of uh, similar kind of um, 3D images. And this has the potential of using in human activity recognition. Like the, this is the Velodan LiDAR that's providing, it's a rotating LiDAR, it's a high resolution LiDAR providing really accurate human uh, shape. And that could be used for human activity recognition. And this Velodan LiDAR that I just showed generated several images, it is a really expensive one. It does have a $80,000 device very high resolution and high ranges and so many point clouds like the 2.2 million point clouds per second it could generate what about the low resolution solid state lighter like the, this is the solid hypersense solid state lighter um is a 269 and it has uh, only 35 frame per seconds and here the field of view is 76 by 32 degree where resolution is 160 by 60 that's, and 50 meter in range. And you can take a look that there is a clear differences between the pellet and lighter and the hypersense solid state lighter, like the checking watch could be more clear than this noisy environment. And uh, waving both hands is more clear here than the hypersense solid state lighter. And this situation is really comp more complex in multiple persons. And you can take a look there, it's really hard to, there's so many noises out there and it's not clear what the, each person is doing. Actually, the one person is checking watch, another person is waving both of the hands. So the goal of the paper is to remove the noises in low resolution lighter point clouds and identify and track multiple persons, detect multiple persons activities, and finally improving the activity recognition by domain adaptation from simultaneously collected video data, uh, lighter data, high resolution data, or whatever. The overall framework looks like there is a data collection schemes. We built uh, 
a system already collected data, then we did some pre-processing, then multiple person tracking framework we built, and the, finally the deep learning based variational autoencoder for domain adaptation model we built for activity recognition in multiple inhabitant scenario. Our system, is look, system looks like this. We have a Jetson Nano, we have a camera out there, we have a lighter and a Raspberry Pi to connect all together. The first step is the transformation. In the, in the transformation, we do remove the background first, then we do some uh, min-max um, minimization here, the maximum minimum distance factor. So after several trial and error, we figured out 0.25 meter for minimum distance and 15 meter for maximum distance. And we trim down the, uh, the lighter point cloud to make it robust. Then we followed the voxel fitting algorithm proposed, proposed by Lopez Serrano and Hassan. So we ran a series of experiments to find the right voxel fitting parameters that's proposed by Serrano. And we obtained highest voxel resolution size with lowest error in detecting object volumes using allometry detection for object volume estimation method proposed by Serrano. And we find that optimized voxel grid resolution is 0.2 centimeter and voxel mapping method AXO mapping is the highest performing. Then we applied the DB scan. DB scan to gen we, gen generate, we generated the voxel point cloud data that are dispersed and not informative enough to detect distinct objects. So our model uses a sequence of clustering algorithms that gives more distinct between objects in frame. So we merge point into clusters using DB scan and the density of our clustering method separates the cloud based on the distance in 3D space. We perform frame training to extract the final sequence for activity recognition training. Here you can take a look at the different steps, like the first one is the raw point cloud of the two persons standing here. Uh, one person is waving and another person is checking watch. And we did the transformation using the background removal and you can see that a lot of noise has been gone. Then we did the voxelization. There's a little bit shape we can see then we can we use the DB scan that automatically remove the anomalies. And finally, we use the person tracking that can provide really fine grained uh, visualization of two persons and also their um, corresponding activity pattern. So multiple person tracking, um, we consider the centroid of DB scan based clusters in our multiple person tracking in the tracker. So we could use like the multiple particle filter considering it's centroid as individual particle. But the problem is there's some requirement of fast tracking of individual targets. And this needs to resolve, resolve on reliable node sequences such system noise and path ambiguity. There's another requirement of scaling for multi user tracking where user motion trajectories may cross over with each other in all possible ways. And after multi-user tracking of cluster centroids, we have to recluster voxelized point clouds for activity recognition of each person. So we, we, we used uh, adaptive order hidden marker model for multiple person tracking since the since our uh, DBs can provide centroid, the centroid is considered as a tracker point, and we use the adaptive um, order hidden marker model. It, adaptive order hidden marker model is a modified hidden marker model with a discrete time stochastic process. It, it can be defined this way, like the during state selection, um, the adaptive order hidden marker model chooses only the subset of states that are active and the neighbor states. That means order of hidden marker model will be changed based on the number of active states and their neighbors. So this, this reduces the computation complexity without compromising the accuracy of particle cluster centroid tracking. The substrate selection in adaptive order hidden marker model also does not affect the optimality of hidden marker model. Vector B computation in our replication scenario, as we apply 
adaptive order hidden marker model on pre-constructed voxel space. Standard V2B decoding algorithm is modified for multiple observation, multiple sequence decoding and feeding for the activity awareness. And for non-overlapping motion, V2B algorithm is computed on first order hidden marker model where transitions from time T minus one to T are considered. And for overlapping motion, V2B algorithm is computed on second order hidden marker model where transitions from time T minus two and T minus one to T are considered. So this is the two order and this is single order. The next step is the heterogeneous domain adaptation by variational autocon encoder. The goal of this uh, entire model we call is VIDA, variational auto encoder for domain adaptation. The goal is to transfer high resolution LIDAR to low resolution LIDAR data to improve the LIDAR based activity. So we have the reload and LIDAR data set and this is a low resolution. We, have to, we are trying to transfer the knowledge here to improve this accuracy. So at first let's formulate the problem. The problem we have a source data domain and we have the source features and the source labels as well. And the source task can be defined as probability of given source features and uh, probability of source label given the source features. Let's consider the target domain is the union of labeled and unlabeled data. So target domain is to predict the target class labels of unlabeled data with, um, with the unlabeled target data. More specifically, the learning probability distribution would be the probability of Unlabeled, um, unlabeled labels given the unlabeled relevant features. So we assume that the source domain data X of S, F, X um, superscript S, consists of source domain specific information, U superscript S, and domain inferent inform information V. On the other hand, target domain data that should be T, consists of the target domain specific information, UT and domain invariant information. So you can see that the domain invariant information is same, that is our assumption. So if we denote Z simple as the representation space, for example, Z superscript source is the feature representation space of X, then probably X superscript A's, then the probability of Z A's given the feature is, is the probability of Z T, the target probability of the feature, uh, feature representation equals to V. So we have the very generic activity recognizer and this, this is our baseline recognizer. And this baseline has been used in encoder and decoder. In decoder would be the exactly symmetric order in opposite. So the baseline uh, we used here to build a similar kind of, this kind of variational auto encoder. Let me explain the variational encoder. So the goal of the variational auto encoder with domain adaptation is to minimize the distribu distribution discrepancy between the source and target feature space. ZS and ZT. So we use the kill divergence loss function to minimize this discrepancy along the train. So the source data X superscript S and the target data XT are fed to the source and target domain from a randomly selected but same labels. One is a self-construct on loss of the um, variational or encoder Autoencoders set to source autoencoder optimization loss added with KL divergence loss between the representation space ZS and that source construct on this is the source construct features. And the loss function for the source autoencoder can be defined as this way, where the the P of X is under, uh, subscript I represents 
the encoder of the source and is, is the pre prediction probability of source features by the source encoder decoder and alpha is the waiting parameter for KL divergence loss. So on the other hand, the weighted sum of self reconstruction loss and uh, KL divergence loss function between the source and the target representation space is set to the target of encoder as loss function. This loss function can be defined in this way. Here beta is the weighting parameter in order. Enforce the comparative importance of reconstruction loss and KLD loss. So we train them, uh, now how are you gonna train the classifier? So after training the source and target autoencoders, we train the common classifier of the baseline um, neural network with a learned feature space ZS of the source encoder and the labels of the source network. With, we then transfer the learned classifier to the target network and use to classify the target feature representation, the ZT. During the learning of the classifier, we make the source encoder network frozen. So the learning objective would, can be defined like this. So the data set, we collected some data set, we employed six volunteers and seven different activities we considered and three different rooms we considered and one out of scenario. In total, 45 minutes of data we have, 25 of them single person, 20 minutes of them multiple persons. So for grounded labeling, we use the camera recorded videos as well as the LIDAR point cloud representation. We define the entire LIDAR field view as 1000 by 800 resolution of Austin space. And while annotating ground truths, we label XY plane for location annotation where we consider the head location of each person as centroid. We also have available data that we found online, the Benedict data to compare our frameworks. If you can see, we found, we downloaded this data. That is a high resolution vel velodyne um, you know, radar based data collector. And there's 28 participants and uh, seven the same and five different activities out there in six different rooms. For the multiple person tracking baseline, we considered three different baseline methods. The first one is, it is the multiple particle filter. Um, so it's a Hungarian algorithm assisted color filter tracking. That's the most, um, common tracking algorithm that we remove the adaptive order, uh, hit a marker model and DV scan from there. The tracker to this second one tracker, we have the lemma tracker without DV scan. Third one, we have the lemma tracker without adaptive hit marker model, but with the um, DV scan. And finally, we consider everything all together and we see that differences. And we figured out that the tracker one that is the existing framework that provides um, the decent tracking accuracy and this accuracy is equally distance between the person's original location, like the head location and the, the tracker provided location. And uh, for single person, you can see that, um, and for the tracker too, we see that uh, not much imp improvement. Um, and sometimes we see that the decrease in mostly in the outside scenarios. And tracker three provides all uh, improvements, but there's another uh, decrease out there. We can see there uh, for crossover uh, sessions. Finally, we see that the, for our model where we consider adaptive order heater marker model, especially for crossover sessions and everything got improved. For heterogeneous domain adaptation baselines, we implemented several uh, heterogeneous domain adaptation framework, like the domain adversarial training of neural networks, then choral network, then adversarial dropout regulation, then virtual adversarial domain adaptation, decision boundary adaptation refinement training model, then associated domain adaptation model and self ensemble for visual domain adaptation model we implemented. And we compared all of the models with our model. You can take a look there where we consider only the source only and we try to transfer from Benedict data to Lemur data, our data set. We figured out 
that our model providing highly accurate accuracy than others. And for the lamer to Benedict data, so even the low resolution lamer data also can improve the accuracy as well of the Benedict data. So in conclusion, our model is the first of its kind adaptive uh, activity detection technique in multiple inhabitant light resistant environments. Our model also presents first of its kind multiple person tracking in lighter environment with best accuracy achieved in indoor environment. The data collection part was one of the most challenging parts during the COVID situation. And due to these limitations, we were able to engage only six unique users with maximum occupancy of three persons in a single study. However, we also could not facilitate outdoor activity decoction test beds for multiple persons due to the ongoing lockdown situation. Thank you for attending the presentation. Take care. Hi everybody, my name is Nicola Sacumano and today I'm going to present you our work title Let's forget about exact signal strength, indoor positioning based on access point ranking and recurrent neural networks. As you might have understood from the title, we are in the field of indoor positioning, which is the task of identifying the position of something or someone inside the building. And we can express this position in, very in many different ways with tag of labels, for instance, uh, building A, floor, five, room, uh, Y, or with coordinates as we do for the outdoor context or by, a, or by a mix of the two approaches. Historically, positioning has mainly focused on outdoor positioning where we can rely on GNSSS. So, uh, the classical um, <clears throat> solution that we use relying on satellite signals, which is able to provide a very accurate estimate for the position, but that cannot be exploited indoor because the signals emitted by the satellites are uh, not uh, reliable in indoor context. So specific techniques that take into account indoor peculiarities have to be developed. Indoor positioning research is thus fundamental and is further motivated by the many important application of indoor positioning, such as uh, contact tracing, access control, and indoor navigation, and many, many others. Of course, there are a lot of different techniques and technologies that can be used in the indoor positioning. And in this work, we focus on one specific, that is Wi-Fi fingerprinting. Wi-Fi fingerprinting, and more generally fingerprinting, work as follows. We have two phases. In the offline phase, uh, what we do is the site survey or the radio map construction, which is that at some specific predefined location around the building, we get an observation, in this case, of the Wi-Fi network. That is, we observe which access point and the, and the receive signal strength for those access point at that specific location. Those information with the information related to the position are combined together forming the fingerprint that is stored inside the fingerprint database. In the online phase, at an unknown position in the building, we get a new observation of the Wi-Fi data, and those data are given as, as input to the fingerprinting algorithm, which, if it is a model, or in the case of finger or in the case of finger deterministic fingerprinting, compare this entry with the one stored in the database in order to give you an estimate of the position. We, re we decided to rely on Wi-Fi fingerprinting because, as it is stated by the literature, it has many advantages. Two of these ones are the following. It, very, it is very easy to deploy since Wi-Fi today is ubiquitous. We can find access points mostly everywhere and moreover, the Wi-Fi data, the Wi-Fi network status can be observed by uh, many different devices that can be easily carried by user or by uh, objects in the world of Internet of Things. And, and another point is that we do not need to uh, position 
to sorry we do not need to know the position of the access point um, um, and that is not true for other technique for indoor positioning even based on the uh, Wi-Fi but of course there are some uh, limitations some issues that still need to be to addressed in the community the most impairing things for the large diffusion of Wi-Fi fingerprinting is the radio map construction which is a time, labor, and money-consuming task. Another problem um, is the propagation of the Wi-Fi signals in indoor environments. Those signals propagate in a very regular manner due to the um, structure of the building uh, and due to uh, the presence or not of people inside the building, inside the room. So um, we have very irregular propagation that makes the wall fingerprinting process very complex. And this uh, element is, is made even more complicated due to heterogeneity in usages and uh, specifically in devices. We have that different devices due to hardware constraints or hardware characteristics for the same position might have different observation of the Wi-Fi network. Again, making the fingerprinting uh, process complex. And last but not least, there is a lack of standards. In this work, we are going to focus mainly on the, uh, on the topic of irregular propagation and let's say uh, noise related to uh, signal strength in the indoor context. And what we want to achieve is, try, is uh, lowering as much as possible the influence of the of signal noise uh, without impacting the performance. So having performance comparable to the state-of-the-art solution. And to achieve this, we relied on a very particular and specific uh, representation of the fingerprint, which is ranking-based fingerprinting. Um, ranking-based fingerprinting moves uh, the representation from the one depicted here in the top part of the figure, so where we have for each access point the exact signal strength, to a representation more compact where we have uh, an ordered array, an ordered list uh, where we just have the identifier of the access point and the order in the list in the array is given by looking at the signal strength um, of the original fingerprint. So our approach is, okay, let's try to uh, lower remove the influence of signal noise by removing from the fingerprinting algorithm the signal strength as much as possible. So ranking-based fingerprinting, fingerprinting according to the, to the literature is more stable and compact representation than classical fingerprint, but it is less informative. It's clear that we have less information than the full-fledged fingerprints. And so it has been generally observed that um, algorithms that exploit ranking-based fingerprinting show worse performance than a full-fledged fingerprint-based counterpart. Our key idea is the following one. We observe that ranking-based fingerprinting somehow resembles sentences in natural language processing. In natural language processes, we have sentences uh, composed by word, and the sentence have a specific meaning. If we change the words, or the, or, or the order of the words in the sentence, we find ourselves with a sentence with a completely different meaning. In, in ranking-based fingerprinting, we have a very similar situation. Access points can be considered as words. As words. So, a ranking-based a ranking fingerprint has a specific meaning, which is the position, the location that it represents. If we alter, if we change the ranking-based fingerprint, changing the order of the access point or changing the access point, we get a new fingerprint and thus a new position. So our idea is that, okay, perhaps we can model indoor, indoor position based on, rank, on ranking-based fingerprint using the same kind of deep learning models that are used nowadays to uh, tackle uh, natural language processing or more generally sequence-like data. And so we uh, develop two uh, recurrent neural network uh, models. Um, each one that takes as an input a sequence, which is the 
single ranking base fingerprint, where each access point uh, have, has to be considered as a time point or as a word. Uh, the problem is posed that in a multi-class classification like settings, so our algorithm returns as the tags of the uh, mm, estimated position, and the two models uh, are different in this way. Uh, the flattened model um, basically uh, works um, not uh, exploiting the hierarchical structure that there is encoded implicitly in the problem. In position, we can uh, see the position as divided uh, in, in a hierarchical manner, looking at the building, the floor, and the room. This is a hierarchy of information that tells us where you are. In the flattened model, this is not exploited because the three, these three labels are basically concatenated together, um, generating one single label. In the hierarchical model, instead, we leverage this kind of information uh, dedicating to each one of these uh, of these levels of, of the hierarchy uh, one specific uh, output of the uh, recurrent neural network um, making first of all the model more uh, general because if we have different hierarchies we it, it is really easy to extend the model to handle them but uh, other advantages of this kind of modeling is that uh, we reduce the output size in terms of parameters and those in terms of the size or the, of the search space compared to the flattened model. And above everything, it allows us to reason about this hierarchical component in an independent way in the post processing phase because we have probabilities for each one of these elements. Uh, that are independent from the other. We can analyze them, leverage them um, as we need. Finally, from a technical point of view, in, we uh, implemented all this model as a bidirectional LTMS. From an experimental point of view, we considered three large data sets already exploited in the literature of indoor positioning system. Two single building multi-floor environments and one multi-building setting. Two of these data sets were collected by experts, while another one, the other, another was collected uh, in crowd searching. So we have different environments, but even different uh, underneath technique, techniques. Another important feature of the multi-building multi data set is that its test set uh, has been sampled several months after the training set. Um, meaning that we have one data set that really uh, represents a real scenario where we have access points that we do not have in the training phase present in the test phase. This is because during uh, this month, of course, your network configuration might change. And we evaluated three different things. We compare our solution with respect to state of the art. We evaluated um, how the performance changes um, varying the number, the length of the access point considering in the ranking. And then we um, did a, um, a study of the impact of noise perturbation, uh, in, so how the performance changes when introduce noise on the test state. Concerning the first evaluation, so the comparison with state of the solution, we, we get very, uh, very good results. <clears throat> because we observed that um, our models, and here and in the rest of the slide, I will focus on the hierarchical model, uh, which is the, the most promising one, um, has achieved a better or in par uh, performance uh, compared to all the other uh, state of the art solution applied on the three considered data sets. And um, this is a very good result cons considering that uh, the representation of the data that we use is less informative than the one used by the other approaches uh, because all of them were using uh, the full-fledged fingerprints or even more richer representation like trajectory, so sequence of fingerprints. Um, we performed visibly worse than just uh, one other solution. 
Uh, another very in, important f element is that we observe that comparing our solution with another ranking-based approach uh, in one of these data sets, it's really clear that we outperform that um, past approach, uh, meaning that our solution can really contribute to improving the state of the art for uh, indoor position. The second evaluation we performed was the access point reduction. So. Um, uh, all the other tests in this paper have been considered picking a fixed threshold, so a fixed length uh, of the ranking, but then we study how the performance change varying this length. And we did that because we, we, we observed that this parameter could be really important to, to, to develop effective solution in this way in, for this kind of model, of course. Um, so here are the threshold uh, that we consider. Uh, the blue one is the default one, and then we consider all the other ones. Um, what we can uh, what we can observe uh, mainly from the error distribution over here is that um, it's not it, 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 we cannot observe a very huge downgrade of the performance where we change the ranking length. And this means that it, we can achieve good performance even taking into account a relatively small number of access points because uh, the green line here and here um, is about nine access points. So we, ju we just consider nine access points to build up our ranking. The performance are reasonably closer to the, to the others. We only observe a very huge downgrade in performance picking the lowest value, um, which produce the lower curve over here um, and that number of access point is equals to, to two so if we have very very short lengths uh, sh sh yeah, short lengths um, there is no way that the algorithm is able to distinguish between different fingerprints and different position um, so the main take home message from this is that ranking length is quite relevant uh, for this kind of approaches and its proper selection may lead to uh, a future improvement because we observed that the best solution for our model are not achieved with the, uh, the full threshold we picked but uh, with another one so the the black one for instance um, and moreover this um, this length is important to determine the the dimension of the wall model uh, the last analysis we performed was this noise injection. So we injected additive white gaussian noise following the distribution reported over here that has been chosen looking at the literature. There was, there was one paper stating that uh, this, this representation was reasonable uh, to, to, to represent noise in indoor uh, positioning based on Wi-Fi fingerprint. We applied this noise only on the test set, of course, and what uh, it can be, uh, what uh, we can observe from the error distribution is that uh, there is not um, relevant downgrade in performance uh, varying the amount of noise introducing uh, introduced to the to the network. So it's clear at this point that um, what, uh, what the main goal that we wanted to achieve, so to have a model that is somehow resilient, robust to noise perturbation till some extent, um, this goal has been reached. And of course, as we saw before, uh, our model has also a very good uh, accuracy compared to state of the art. So both our goal can be considered as rich. Um, going back to this analysis of robustness, um, we can see that uh, even comparing the success rate, which is the amount of correctly identified building and floors uh, with respect to another literature based on our model uh, um, seems to be less affected by noise also in uh, according to this, to this metric because for high level of noise uh, our um, performance time grade less than the considerate, considerate literature based. So in this work we presented a novel solution for Wi-Fi fingerprint-based indoor positioning, combining a ranking-based representation of the fingerprints and recurrent neural networks. We showed that our approach performed better 
or in part with the vast majority of state of the art solution on free public data sets, even using a far more uh, um, less informative, let's say, a far more compact representation of data. So basically using less data than the other. We highlighted how relying on the proposed simple but effective representation, it's possible to reduce the influence of signal noise perturbation without impacting or impacting or in a uh, very uh, low way the positioning accuracy. So future work, uh, we intend to study deeper uh, the uh, robustness to noise injection considering different kind of noise and different level of noise to, to see till which point the model is robust. We want to further understand the appear removal, uh, the access point removal effect, and till which extent the model is able to resist to high money to network changes. We want to extend the analysis to other deep learning models like one dimensional convolution neural networks, and we want to even co uh, consider more uh, advanced techniques related to sequence model like embedding for the inputs or attention. Finally, we want to evaluate the generalizability of the approach to other fingerprint data like cellular data or scenarios outdoors and data representation like trajectories. Thank you for the attention. Hello everyone, I'm Kafil from Swinburne University of Technology, Melbourne, Australia. I'll be presenting today my paper title is Feature Recommendation by Mining, Updates and User Feedback from Competitor Apps. Here is the uh, outline of my slides. Uh, I'll be discussing about the introduction and what motivates me about this research and the problem of the research and our approach. And in our approach, we'll be discussing about the feature extractions, sentiment extractions from the reviews, and finally, feature classification and feature ranking. And we will end up with discussing about our results and evaluations and concluding and uh, conclusion and limitations of the paper. So as you know, the App Store is the source of apps to be downloaded, rated, and reviewed. Usually, the App Store works as the communication channel between the developers and the users. So a user can write down their comments, and developers can see those comments in the store. So App Store potentially forms the largest competition place for the app uh, apps. And mobile app market, as you know, it's a very attractive place. However, building a successful app is extremely hard. So in this work, we are focusing on feature recommendation from the competitor apps for any given app. So the given app means here we target it. So as you know, the developers from, uh, from a number of existing literatures, we see that the developers want to learn about the, their competitors. Basically, they don't want to focus on their own users, rather they want to focus on their competitors and see how the competitors are doing. And in another literature, we can see that uh, the developers are saying specifically that uh, looking into the competitors' reviews, so they are saying where they are trying to look at, uh, is something that we need to see if the feature we included were appreciated by the people. So they want to test their features, what they have launched in their app. They want to test, uh, see the features, whether, whether they are appreciated in the uh, uh, community apps. So existing literature, we found that um, in the existing works, they only focus on the reviews of own app but not the competitors also the, there is no classification or ranking of features from the competitors we know that there are a lot of works existing works we can see they classify and rank the features from their own app but not the competitors 
So the research basically we have three research problems focus here. One is the identification of popular and unpopular features from the competitor apps and how to identify them. And as you know that uh, this is the, the this is relating to the, the sentiments when we say the popular and unpopular features in an app. So how the users are expressing their sentiments. And secondly, we are planning, we are trying to classify, automatically classify those uh, popular and unpopular features per competitor apps. As you know, the ad target app has a number of competitors, so per competitor apps and a per competitor category. What are the popular and unpopular features? And finally, we are trying to rank them per competitor app as well as per competitor category. So this is the overview of our approach. In this overview, we have mainly three portions. The first portion is extraction of features. So this is the step one. We are extracting features from what's new. What's new means the app updates. As we know, the apps are updated frequently. So basically the most uh, frequently downloaded apps have most frequent updates. So we are trying to extract the features from app updates means apps what's new and also we are extracting features from the reviews so the input is here competitor apps it means for any given target app we first calculate the competitor apps we first find out what are the competitor apps uh, by using our one of our existing work and then we extract the features from their updates and the reviews after that, in a step two, we try to find out the relevance of features, the what's new to the reviews, and then we classify them. After classification, we rank them, and we finally find the popular and unpopular feature ranking. Also, um, uh, for reviews, what we do, we extract the sentiments of the reviews, because this is very important to see what features are popular or unpopular. So in the step one, as I have discussed already, that is step one, we are going to extract the features. And step two, we are going to find the feature relevance and we are, to, we are, class, we are going to classify them. And in step three, we are going to see the, the rank of the, of the popular and unpopular features. So first step is we are going to extract the features. So to extract the features from app updates and uh, uh, app reviews, we use an existing work called SAFE. So this is an existing work, which is a rule-based work, uses a number of rules, um, 18 parts of speech patterns and five sentence patterns it uses and extracts features in terms of like unigram, bigram and trigram and etc. So we use this existing work, which is very popular one, and uh, to extract the features from app updates and uh, app reviews. So this is an example, as we can see, like example of feature extraction, how we get the features. If we see the left side is showing the worst new features and the worst, worst new means app update, one app updates. And app review text we can see some review given by the users and after extraction we can see the right hand side we can see what are the extracted feature and how how it looks like so for example in the in the what's new uh, uh, text and the what's new extracted features are like find friends play games chat tabs and so on we can see that uh, messenger chat etc also for extraction of features from the reviews, we can see the go album, choose picture, album phone, a scroll picture, no picture, something like that. These are the features extracted from the review text. Then the other step is we extract the at, uh, review sentiments. As you know, that each review has the sentiments user have explain, either express their sentiments in that 
review so we ex uh, we extract that sentiment whether it is positive sentiment or negative sentiment and mainly we use an existing word from image uh, to extract the sentiments and this is an example uh, of 100 facebook reviews and we can see that uh, from the reviews we can see the scores are pretty much up and down we can see that the positive scores and the negative scores and if you notice carefully uh, pretty much the uh, sentiments are inversely working with the positive and the negative one and after that this is the this is a key step of feature to feature relevance matching so we want to match that which review is talking about which feature in the app updates so this is the key part here so to do that as you know the worst new features are written in the natural language so what we do we have to find out a semantic uh, a semantic similarity for example like photo editing image editing and edit picture that could should be similar so we used a semantic tool called a popular semantic tool called wordnet which is very popular all over the world and it's a lexical uh, database for english language which is uh, finds the shortest path between two words in the language ontology so uh, we use that tool for finding uh, what's new to the the review uh, feature relevance in this case we used a matrix called m into m like uh, uh, calculates like the features of uh, reviews and features of uh, what's news and try to find out which one may have the highest if you see i s i j is the max we are taking maximum feature relevance score of from each reviews see it means which of, of the review is talking about specifically which feature in the worst view or app updates so this is an example we we employ o palmer uh, palmer path similarities uh, technique here to find out the relevance score and we have a huge matrix of these relevance schools however we are not taking the all the all the similarity schools however we are taking only the maximum school that is matching with the uh, app updates or uh, that is the the app updates is talking about which specific feature and which review is giving uh, uh, talking about that feature so in order to classify so this diagram shows how we classify the the features so in this case we try to answer three questions in feature classification does the review feature relevant to what's new you see is it yes or no so it is how far relevant so we set a threshold which is which should be over the limit of um, you know, 0.06 based on uh, 0.6 based on the existing literature some of the literatures has taken it like 0 0.55 0 0.6 so we have taken an a, 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 a threshold set of threshold like each each of the of the features that are talking about the app updates should be at least higher than 0.6 and then which way they are relevant are they are relevant in positive or negative sense so if they are in positive they, so they should be in talking positively and if they are in negative so they should they are talking negatively so we are trying to find an answer these three classifications so these are the algorithms we have used for feature classifications as you see like first of all uh, first step in line number one we are initializing the word net and in line number uh, nine we are showing uh, the extraction of features and and in line number 16 we show the extraction of feature part from each reviews and finally if you see the line number 26 we are trying to classify them uh, based on their relevance scores and the sentiments and so on and so forth and finally we find out um, um, we we find out the uh, 
So we return the class features. So we calculate here the ranking of uh, part competitor apps, uh, feature ranking part competitor apps. Uh, we use the equation given here. Uh, we define the ranking function and we uh, calculate the ranking part competitor apps uh, based on the number of reviews or uh, review features in the feature class and user sentiments and the relevance score and finally the priority of the feature class. So how this feature class gets and the priority of the uh, among all the feature classes and finally we we after that we rank part competitor app um, uh, uh, we rank the features part competitor apps after we calculate the uh, the feature cl we cl classify them we rank them so we basically rank them based on their sentiments, re relevance scores, and and uh, the priority scores, the computer rank of the class. So and uh, and the next step, we calculate the feature ranking per category. So in each category, what are the features ranked here? So how feature are ranked? So here we can see here we can we compute that. Um, uh, compute we, we include the competitive test scores if I see CI so this is based on one of our, one of our existing work we can we compute the uh, the competitiveness of the the competitors so how far they are competitive and then we uh, we calculate the weighted uh, score of each of the of the feature in the whole category so wa is calculating calculated by dividing the number of features in the category by the total number of features in the whole category so whole competitive category and a number of the same features in the in that category so in this case we use the jacquard coefficient here so as you can see um, the feature uh, feature ranking we, we can this is the algorithm we use for the feature ranking and as we have discussed we, we take into consideration multiple factors to rank them basically the competitiveness and we calculate the weight of the uh, of the feature and then uh, we take the rank of the feature so we we calculate the overall ranking of that feature in that category and we should note that we have used the jacquard similarity in this case because uh, this is the uh, in this case we don't need to find semantic similarity we have already calculated semantic similarity so jacquard similarity is sufficient for calculating the similarity of features in that uh, across in the whole category competitive categories so we validate our methods uh, by feature classifications uh, using the truth set we have uh, we have uh, taken our or we manually built a truth set of for 30 competitor apps and 10 categories and 10 different apps so all together we took uh, 10 were updates and 100 reviews per competitor apps in, a, in one category so a total of 300 updates and 3000 reviews at total and finally we have rank we validate our ranking based on the thumbs up score given publicly available in the google play store so we evaluate the evaluation metrics we have used like the precision recall and f measure and also we calculate the euclidean distance of uh, the the truth set and the observed set so the lesser the distance is the higher the uh, classification accuracy is and feature ranking we calculate using using the ndcg at top k uh, as you can see uh, based on our uh, our techniques we ob we have used six different techniques here uh, for feature classification and we have taken the the topmost one which gives the higher precisions and 
uh, higher F score and higher images. So we can see overall feature by feature, what's new feature, each feature by what's new review, each review features. So the sixth technique we can see that gives the highest score in uh, the, the feature relevance. And overall uh, result for the NDCG at 10 ranking part, uh, results shows that uh, uh, overall the scores are for popular features is very high and for unpopular features is higher than the popular one you can see and, and the par category popular features are, are almost uh, around six points uh, more than 0.6 and for unpopular feature is very higher than uh, 0.65. So we have observed approximately, uh, we have observed four different uh, uh, key things here in the, um, in the evaluations and results. We can see that um, uh, ranking results. We see the first one is popular features. Unpopular features are almost always higher, have higher scores than the popular one. Also, uh, we observed that there is a significant difference between ranking per category and ranking per uh, across uh, each app. The reason here is that we used the competitive analysis school, which is not available in the data set. We also observed that some features are equally hated and loved by the users, so it seems like that that feature is more popular or more important to the users. And the number fourth observation is like we see that um, the competitors uh, have some of the some of the competitor works new and updates or updates have mutually exclusive features. So it means uh, there was no uh, none of the computer have same feature at the same observed period of time. To conclude, uh, uh, we have used like four alternative techniques for feature classifications and. We also rank popular and popular features per competitor app and per competitor category. However, in this work, we have some limitations. Like we have used the extraction techniques, which is an existing one. However, this is the best one uh, in the, among the existing works. Also, we, as you know, the sentiments are very subjective, might not be always correct. So we extract these sentiment techniques using another existing work from a major. Uh, however, the result reveals a very promising, uh, uh, promising uh, scores uh, for feature by feature uh, for feature classifications. The feature by feature relevance approach is very effective. Also, in case of ranking, a score is always higher than 0 0.75 per 0 0.72 per competitor app for popular features, however, the score is even higher for unpopular features like approximately 0.0.81. The overall score is higher than 0.65 across all categories for both the popular and unpopular features. So uh, this shows the efficacy of our techniques. And uh, we also plan to improve this work by recommending trending features across the stores to the developers thank you so much i hope you like the presentation please feel free to ask me any questions or send your queries in my email i'll be happy to answer thank you Hello everyone, today I will present our latest work entitled Watching the Watchers, Resource Efficient Mobile Video Decoding Through Context-Aware Resolution Adaptation. The exponential growth of the mobile computing field that we all witnessed in the past years has also changed the way we consume information via mobile devices. As we moved from traditional voice and text media to video, the amount of content seen through mobile video is more than doubling every two years. More than 70% of YouTube watch time comes from mobile devices 
and the forecast expect that by 2022, almost 80% of the world's mobile data traffic will be video. Adding on top of this, the recent COVID-19 pandemic, and we see that the mobile video streaming has grown even more. However, the proliferation of mobile video and in general mobile computing is hindered by the physical constraints and limitations of the underlying hardware. Among these, a key issue is the one related to the battery life. Um, we know that battery technology is experiencing a um, disproportionately slower growth compared to other mobile resources. We can see here this huge gap between um, the battery um, density and the mobile CPU speed. Uh, this is something that users also indicated as the most wanted smartphone feature in uh, a recent survey. Um, so this leads to um, the need for um, further efforts towards the efficient use of the existing however limited resources available on mobile devices. In this context, our solution comes from the approximate computing field, a paradigm that uh, is based on the observation that the result of a computation doesn't always need to be perfectly accurate in order to satisfy the end user needs. Building upon this idea, approximate mobile computing introduces approximation on mobile devices, taking into consideration the context of use, which in mobile computing tends to vary over time. As such, in this work, we investigate the opportunity for improving the energy efficiency of mobile video playback by adjusting the playback resolution according to the actual context-dependent needs of a mobile user. Building upon the approximate mobile computing philosophy, our study aims to answer three key questions. The first two are targeting the hypothesis that the context in which a mobile video is played impacts the user's perception of the content. We focus on the two most relevant and intuitive dimensions, user's physical activity in the first research question and the characteristics of the mobile video being played in the second. In addition to the third research question, we are interested in the potential of enabling energy saving by adjusting video playback according to the current context. A monotonically increasing relationship between the computation accuracy and the resource consumption is at the core of approximate computing. Since mobile video is one of the most preeminent and energy-hungry aspects of mobile computing, we chart the relationship between the video decoding quality and the mobile energy consumption. This shows, on one hand, a significant difference in power consumption for playing videos using hardware versus software decoding, and on the other, a generally increasing trend. The higher the decoding quality or resolution, the higher the consumption is. This confirms that video decoding resolution represents a suitable knob for approximate mobile computing. In order to control this approximation knob, we make the assumption that the context impacts the user's requirements with respect to the video playback resolution. By context, we consider all the factors that impact human attention and sensory systems, and thus shaping the perception of video playback. Such factors include, among others, the movement of the playback device when watching the video, outside brightness and other environmental factors, and the properties of the video, such as the dynamic at which the content changes. In this work, we focus on a user's physical activity as the most prominent dimension of the outside context and one that can be acquired with a minimal use of the mobile's energy, for example, by using Google's Activity Recognition API. Besides the physical activity, we also hypothesize that the content of the video, more specifically its spatial and temporal complexity, impacts a user's decision to require a higher or a lower resolution decoding. To investigate these assumptions, we conducted a study with 22 volunteers students from our institution with both technical and non-technical backgrounds. We selected 12 one minute long YouTube videos to be watched by the users. The video content varied among the videos for music, sports, outdoor interactivities and others, resulting in various spatial and temporal characteristics of the videos. Each of the participants in this study 
watched three videos in each activity state, still walking, running, and traveling as a passenger in a vehicle. All the experiments were performed on the university campus in the same laboratory room when still, on the same hallway when walking and running, and on the same route on the campus when traveling as a passenger in a vehicle. Following these experiments, we analyzed the resolutions that were found acceptable when watching videos in each of the four mobility states. The results showed in this black spot distribution are in favor of the first research hypothesis uh, that the activity context of the user impacts her or his perception of the video quality. So um, the data shows users are satisfied with higher resolutions when they watch the video while still. This is to be expected since in such situations a user can fully concentrate on the video. As the context gets more dynamic, however, uh, the quality expectation tend to decrease. As such, the running state leads to the largest drop of resolution distribution. This is not surprising since when engaged in intense physical activity, the user is less likely to be focused on the screen for anything else but brief periods of time. In addition, we performed a statistical analysis of the results. The Kruskal Wallis test shows that there is a significant difference in the acceptable resolution depending on the activity state, confirming the hypothesis that the activity state influences the user's video quality requirements. In order to assess the strength of this relationship, we computed the effect size estimate, eta squared, and the resulted value accounts for a small or weak effect. This shows that while there is a statistically significant relationship between the activity state and the resolution, this relationship is shown to be weak, indicating other factors that influence a user's satisfaction with low resolution in different mobility states exist. As a result, we analyzed the impact of the video content on a user's receptivity to different video resolutions. The kruskal wallis test again showed that there is a statistically significant relationship between the actual video content being played and the user's quality expectations. This time, however, the computed eta squared effect size measure indicates a large or strong effect, confirming our second research hypothesis that there is a strong relationship between the video content and the user's quality expectations when watching the video in specific mobility states. To further assess the influence of video content on user satisfaction in different mobility states, for each video we computed two metrics, the average spatial information SI and the average temporal information TI. SI represents the spatial detail in a video frame, while TI represents the amount of temporal changes. We then computed the Pearson correlation coefficient between the average resolutions and average SI and TI values for each mobility state. This analysis showed that there is a very strong link between the average playback resolution and the SI when a user is running. We can see here a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.84. This is of particular interest to this study since it is the mobility state where one would expect the user satisfaction requirements to drop the most. This strong link shows that when a user is engaged in active physical activity like running, the higher the spatial complexity of the video he is watching, the higher the required resolution. The Pearson correlation analysis also indicates that a moderate positive linear correlation is present between the average playback resolution and the temporal information of the videos when the user is in a mobility state requiring moderate physical movement, such as walking. To better illustrate how the spatial and temporal characteristics of a video influence the user's quality perception in different activity states. Here we illustrate how a selection of videos are perceived by the users when standing still versus running. The table and chart display the average resolutions for each video in each of the two activity states. And it is noticeable that videos 6, 8 and 9 show a similar behavior. They score similar average resolutions when still and their average resolutions drop considerably when running. Video 11, however, has a different behavior. Compared to still, the average resolution does not decrease while running, on the contrary, it slightly increases. 
The reason behind this phenomena is that video 11 has the highest spatial information index among all 12 videos and thus users perceptually require higher resolutions when running and viewing this video compared to other videos with lower spatial complexity. To statistically examine the interplay between the physical activity and the video content and its role on a user's expectations, we created a linear regression model. This linear regression analysis confirmed that when users are walking or running, they require a low resolution. Moreover, the analysis indicated that the effects of the spatial and temporal complexity of a video on the required resolution are not relevant by themselves, but only uh, correlated with certain mobility states. As such, high temporal information videos require higher resolution when a user is walking, while higher spatial information videos require higher resolutions when a user is running. In addition to this, the model also underlined two limitations of our experiments. First, the model indicated that there are other contextual variables that play a role beside the ones that we consider, for example, outside noise and other environmental factors, or perhaps the user's internal motivation. Secondly, uh, we were able to see that um, the model does not fully explain the data due to the fact that in this study, a uh, limited amount of data was collected. We plan to investigate these two limitations and to address them in future studies. With regard to the third research question, investigating potential energy savings brought by uh, an approximate computing approach, our study reveals that the mobile user's quality expectations when watching videos on a mobile device are influenced by both their mobility state and the video content, the spatial and temporal complexity of the video. If we corroborate this with the significant differences in energy consumption for different playback resolutions, we can confirm the feasibility of context and content-driven approximate mobile computing for mobile multimedia apps and its potential to yield significant energy savings. Next, we will provide a realistic energy savings computation for a particular use case, the scenario examined in our study. We first compute the total amount of energy required uh, if all the users in this study would watch all the videos at the highest possible resolution, 1080p, with hardware decoding. The total adds up to 21,000 joules. By examining the collected dataset from this study, we apply a model that accurately approximates the viewing resolution to the level found satisfying by the users. In this case, the total energy consumption drops to 16,000 joules for all the users to watch all the videos. This energy drop translates to a 23.2% potential energy savings when applying the context-aware resolution adaptation model. To conclude, our study showed that acceptable video quality is different for each physical activity. In addition to that, the video's spatial and temporal features impact the quality requirements. As such, the door is open to energy savings through a context-aware adaptation model built upon the philosophy of approximate mobile computing. All these findings were confirmed both experimentally and through statistical tests. This analysis also revealed that there are other factors not examined in this study that may impact a user's perception of a mobile video playback. We intend to examine these factors in future studies and also our plan is to implement real-time approximate mobile computing adaptation by integrating both context and content-based approximations in a mobile multimedia application. The experimental data collected and used in this study is available on our GitLab page. Thank you all for your attention.
Hello, my name is Isabella Lee, and welcome to my presentation on Deep Reinforcement Learning for UAV Assisted Emergency Response. Um, this work was done in collaboration with Vignesh Babu, Professor Matthew Caesar, and Professor David Nichol from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So a quick outline of what we're going to cover today. We're going to start with the motivation and introduction. Um, then we're going to go into some goals and contributions of this work, followed by the proposed solution along with the experiment setup. And then I'm going to cover the evaluation, the results, and finally the conclusion. So to give some context into the situation that we're tackling, um, imagine or sorry, imagine an emergency response situation where you have various groups of first responders that can range from people like firefighters to first aid providers to incident commanders um, and policemen and all these different groups have to work together in order to help handle the situation. And in such situations, a solid communication channel between these different entities is crucial and it can make a huge difference in the efficiency of the mission. But unfortunately, many of the devices and sensors that these first responders will be carrying tend to be low powered and also have limited transmission ranges. And especially when you consider a post-disaster situation where it's possible that many critical communication infrastructure is damaged um, and there can be things like fall and wreckage that can block line of sight between different communication entities. Basically, transmitting information can be pretty difficult. So in such situations, um, it could be really useful if we could deploy a group of unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs and also referred to as drones. Um, and this group of drones can help act as relays and enable communication since they can be quickly deployed and they're also really flexible in terms of being able to adapt to different types of disaster environments. And so in this picture we have sort of like an example of, of how such a system might look like. And um, the green lines that you see connect um, one drone to another. So that's one type of communication channel that we'll focus on. And the other type is from a drone to a user node. And by user node, we're going to define that as any of the different communication and or IoT devices that the first responders might be carrying with them. Um, and these devices are things that would require connectivity to the broader network. And there's many different challenges that are involved in operating such a fleet of UAVs. Um, for example, depending on the channel conditions and the availability of satellite backhaul links, the drones may need to be they need, may need to remain within a certain range of each other in order to communicate. And again, like the, the fall infrastructure and the wrecked buildings might be might get in the way of first responders. And also there might not be direct line of sight between um, the first responders and the base station or from one user to another. And it also uh, basically, the trajectory of each of these nodes and each of the drones can have a big impact on the utility of the overall communication network. So, in this work, we have decided to address this problem and try to figure out a solution for how to best position a UAB relay network in response to the mobility of first responders while also maintaining operation-specific connectivity requirements. And we have named this system um, Drone DR, which stands for Drone Aided Disaster Relief. And specifically, one goal that we have in this um, solution is we want to provide connectivity for connection pairs, which is basically between two user nodes. And this is going to be defined in terms of connectivity requirements, which is basically a list of the different connection pairs that must be satisfied. So an example of how the connectivity requirement might look like is you might want the leader nodes to be connected to all the non-leader nodes within the same group. And you also might want the leader nodes to be connected to the other leader nodes in other groups. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is this isn't a static network we're dealing with 
Instead, all of these nodes have high mobility, and there's a lot of different dynamics involved. Um, so that also adds to the challenge of um, ensuring that this connectivity requirement is satisfied. And so our solution leverages the benefits of a learning-based approach, but we also combine it with the safety of a more restrictive drone movement algorithm that enforces strong connectivity at all times. And we define strong connectivity as basically making sure that every drone can reach every other drone through at least one path in the graph of drones at any point in time. And finally, we want this to be able to perform well for diverse environment specifications. So this means when we vary the number of drones and the number of nodes, um, it doesn't matter like how many drones or how many nodes are in the system, we want this to work well. We also want it to work well for various drone ranges. So if you remember back to the um, previous uh, like picture, there is the drone to drone communication. So for like different ranges, um, we want that to work well. And we also want to be able to handle different types of no mobility models because every post-disaster situation is different and the way that these first responders will be moving will be different. So um, this is a high level overview of how the proposed system will work. So uh, this system will consist of a set of drones, a set of nodes, and a central controller that is fitted with the intelligent positioning algorithm. So the first step of this positioning algorithm is actually to discretize the airspace and the ground space into fixed size grids on a 2D plane. And this is what we're going to use to define the position of the drones and the nodes. And um, the actual size of these grid cells may vary depending on the environment specification. And we'll touch on that in the next slide. But just to give some more background on like the reason why we're using grid cells instead of raw coordinate points, is because when we train a model to learn how to best position drones, um, it's more difficult to have a theoretically infinite possible set of locations as you know possible positions for the drones to move to, which is the, what it would be like if we used raw coordinates. Um, and it's also not really optimal because in the real world, we don't want the algorithm to be sensitive to such fine grain changes in the UAV and ground node positions. So we would rather it be more like uh, we only move the drone if there is a big enough change that would require the drone to move from one grid cell to another rather than like one centimeter over. Um, yeah, so after we have this discretized uh, grid cells, we then feed the position information to our reinforcement learning model. And the model will use this information along with some other signals from the environment to decide the best action to take. And in this case, the action would be um, basically based on which nodes they think are more important at the moment. And it will use that information to decide how to move the group of drones. And we'll go into more details on exactly how this model works in the future slides. Um, and then finally, we, we have an actuator that puts this all into motion by actually moving the drones according to the previous steps movement decisions. And this whole cycle will repeat uh, at each time step. So we focus on two types of environments in which to train and evaluate the system in. The first is a small scale environment. Um, so the total area is 100 meters by 100 meters. And an example of a disaster relief situation this might be for is something like a neighborhood fire. So it's contained within a smaller area. Um, and in such situations, it's possible for the responders to move together in groups. Um, so an example of a node mobility pattern, a node mobility pattern that we would want to use here is something like reference point root mobility. Um, and what this means is we have each, gro each group is designated a leader node, and this leader node will serve as a reference point for the other nodes in the group. Um, so then the non-leader nodes in the group will then deviate from the leader node by a random deviation vector. And for our simulations, we used a two group and five group case um, just to like demonstrate how our system performs with uh, these types of situations within the small scale environment. And then another thing that we need to consider with the environment is these types of situations within the small scale environment. 
And then another thing that we need to consider with the environment is how we define a node to drone connectivity. So um, here we make an assumption that it's based on the radius of uh, basically like how far apart the node's grid cell is from the corresponding drone grid cell. Um, so basically we define the connection status between a drone and a node as positive if their corresponding grid locations are within two units of each other in their projected xy coordinate plane. Um, and for the large scale environment, it's a slightly different situation. First of all, the area covered is bigger. It's a hundred or sorry, a thousand meters by a thousand meters. And an example of an emergency situation this might be representing is something like the 9-11 attacks, where you have a much larger area that's covered. Um, and in this type of environment, the grid cell size would be 50 meters by 50 meters. And the nodes would also move a little differently. So here we assume that the nodes move according to a military troop mobility model. And for our simulation, we used a 40 node case and then a 10 node case. And the way that we define a drone to node connectivity is the radius based assumption again, but also on top of that, we use, um, we basically check if the received signal strength between the drone and the node is above a certain threshold. And we get these received signal strength measurements through a technique called radio frequency ray tracing. So radio frequency ray tracing is a technique that considers a 3D environment effect on radio wave propagation. And by using this type of uh, 3D environment modeling and seeing how the radio waves propagate throughout that 3D environment, we can estimate um, different received powers at different locations between different transmitter and receiver points. And so in this example here, we have an example heat map from a transmitter point to a grid of receiver points. And uh, specifically, the grid of receiver points is uh, located at 200 meters above the ground. And this could represent all the possible drone positions um, where the transmitter would be uh, like one of the user nodes on the ground. And note that this heat map is only for one transmitter point. So um, for like another transmitter point, the heat map could look different. And so we define a drone and a node as having a positive connection status if the received power from the heat map is above a given threshold. And for this ray tracing simulation, we used um, a, soft, a piece of software called Wireless Insight. So for moving on to the modeling side of this work, um, we used reinforcement learning as our learning method. And basically the way that reinforcement learning works is you have an agent that will interact with the environment by taking some action um, and basically seeing the effects of this action on the environment. And you know, after taking action, the different, like the state of the environment will change. And based on how the state changes, um, a reward will be calculated. And this iterative process is basically used to help this agent learn an optimal policy, where the policy would be describing the best set of actions to take given the current state. So to kind of break that down into how we formulated our case for this, um, for the state, we, we had a node state and a drone state. Um, and for the node state, we used the node grid position, the time the node spent at the current location, and the connection status. And the connection status, again, is basically if a node is connected to a drone. And for the drone state, we had the drone grid location, the number of drones, and the number of drones connect, sorry, the number of nodes connected to a drone. And for the action, what we did was we defined the action space as basically describing a list of node IDs for the drones to move towards. And the drones will only move if the movement does not disconnect the drone network. So essentially what our algorithm is learning is not specifically like whether to move each drone left, right, or, you know, like the actual direction, but it's basically deciding what the target pool of nodes should be, like which nodes are most important and which nodes we should try to have the drones cover at this current time. 
given the state, which is like the locations of all the drones and nodes and the different connection statuses. Um, and the reward is going to be basically how many connection pairs are satisfied. So using the connectivity requirement we defined in the beginning, how well is this system actually um, like what percent of these connection pairs are we actually satisfying? Um, so to give more details on how the drone movement algorithm works, the action space again is a list of node IDs. We also call this the node pool. And basically the drones will move towards the nodes in the node pool. Um, and the reinforcement learning is used to find the best node pool given the current state. So to actually define how the movement works. The first step is to sort the nodes in the node pool based on priority. So the priority would basically, in this case, be if a node is a leader node or a non-leader node, with leader nodes having higher priority. And we start with the first node and we sort the drones now. And the drones will be sorted based on the proximity to that node. And then we move the first drone in the node pool towards the node and then we check if this drone movement will disconnect the drone network. And if it does, then we move uh, as many other drones as we need to in the same direction that the first drone move until we see that this network is no longer disconnected. And then we update our drone pool to contain only the drones that haven't moved. And then we continue this iterative process with all the rest of the nodes that are left in the node pool and the drones that are left in the drone pool. Um, and you can find pseudocode and more details in the paper. Um, and then for the evaluation step, we have four uh, main metrics that we looked at. So the first one is the coverage, which is basically if a node has a positive connection status to at least one drone. And then we also look at the average number of connections um, and the fairness and the drone AP utilization. And we compare it with two baselines, the random waypoint model, which is basically where you randomly choose the direction, speed, and duration for each drone to move in, and the Steiner tree heuristic, which is basically a heuristic algorithm based on a graph um, and using a Steiner tree. Um, and then we greedily move each drone from the current position to a target position, which is uh, based on the Steiner tree where the non-terminal vertices represent the desired drone positions. Um, and then we construct another standard tree and the process will repeat once the target positions are reached. Um, so to show some of the results for both the small scale and the large scale environment in terms of the connection satisfied, here we have uh, the average number of connections with increasing radio range on the left and then increasing drones on the right. And you can see that in all of these cases, drone DR outperforms all the other baselines and sometimes it outperforms by a factor of two and even three times. So that's a lot more connection satisfied with our solution. And in terms of coverage, it also outperforms all the rest of them. And it's also interesting to note that, um, you know, it makes sense that as more drones are used, the coverage also increases across the board for all the different algorithms. And for fairness, we see that um, Drone DR is able to reach above 0.9 um, on the fairness scale, although random waypoint is the most fair out of all the algorithms, which makes sense because it is based on randomness and it doesn't really discriminate based on the priority of the nodes, but it also didn't perform well in terms of the other metrics. So uh, basically, drone DR is still able to be very fair um, while still maximizing um, the number of connections and the coverage. And we also have drone utilization shown here. And you can see that, again, drone DR has the best drone utilization out of all the baselines. So to conclude, we propose a framework for intelligently positioning a network of UAVs so that the number of node-to-node -node connections are maximized while inner drone connectivity is maintained. And we found that drone DR was able to outperform the baselines um, and specifically two times the average number of connections achieved by the Steiner algorithm and over three times the average number of connections achieved by the random waypoint model. 
and it was able to perform well regardless of the node mobility model, the number of drones, the number of nodes, and the available drone range. So, thank you for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Rongxie from Wuhan University, China. My topic today is about a flock of a starting optimization algorithm with reinforcement learning capability. This is the outline of my topic today. As we can see, some applications require massive agents to work together to complete some big tasks. We can speak up many examples like industry robots in factory, UAVs express logistics, self-driving cars, and more. An individual agent has limited capabilities, but the agent group can behave a high level of intelligent collaboration. How can autonomous agents collaborate maximally by connected intelligence to a accomplished complicated task is very necessary to design a kind of a optimization algorithm. As an earlier classical algorithm for solving optimization program, PSO was proposed based on group collaboration inspired by Rowland's model and simulated the forging behavior of a bird. In the recent years, biologists have conducted in-depth studies and observations on tens of thousands starting flocks perfect collaboration. Some newly important discoveries provided us a new way to make further improvements on PSO. Some researchers introduced starting flocks behavior to improve PSO, making full use of a collaboration of a flock of starlings, such as FSO, flock OPT, and starling PSO. FSO only partially simulated the behavior of starlings. Flock OPT solved the program of searching for the optimal value in unimodal search space, but filled in multimodal search program. Starling PSO increased group diversity to achieve a wider search space, but it did not discuss collaboration capability. As we can see, the existing research mainly focused on general movement laws of birth and searching optimization of algorithm, but lack in learning capability, result in low convergency efficiency. Therefore, in order to overcome the limitations of a PSO and its improved algorithms, we propose our flock of starting optimization methods and algorithm, supplementing learning capability based on reinforcement learning theory and attention mechanism. This is the overview framework of our method, which is modeled as an Markov decision process, including a pair of uh, interactive objects, that is, uh, agent and environment and the four basic elements, state, action, reward, penalty, and update strategy. At time t, agent observes the current environment state, including individual state and neighborhood state. The served attention mechanism is used to obtain individual state, while local attention mechanism is used to obtain neighborhood state. The current environmental state can be merged through attention alignment. Agent adopts a strategy pi, sends an action signal A, and uh, interacts with the environment. And certainly action A acts on the current state S. Environment moves to a new state and the reward and the penalty. 
Through repeated interactive training, agent continuously updates its own strategies. That is a speed update and location update until it reaches the target state. Agent learns by itself by interacting with environment or obtaining feedback from environment. The goal of learning is to connect as much rewards as possible to achieve global optimization quickly. In the procedure of learning, starting from the elision state, agent moves towards the target state. Evaluate transfer from the current state to the next state with a certain probability. Evaluate feedbacks a reward or penalty to agent according to the reward penalty function. Agent learns and treasury by trialing in evaluate constantly. According to this treasury, it gets the action to be executed in state S and uh, execute any action in the action space with an certainly probability. The update method is described by Bellman equation. Towards the destination, agent gathers its surrounding agents by adaptive adjustment and searches for the optimal position for the next step in the solution space. For it, agent obtains its individual state through self-attention mechanism. Meanwhile, local state of its K neighbor is also obtained through local attention mechanism. Next, agent will move to the weighted center of its individual position and the local position of its neighbors. After time period, each agent dynamically adjusts its speed update and the position update until agent group reaches the destination or the algorithm control reaches the maximum integration. To obtain individual state, we can introduce self-attention mechanism to describe internal relevance that agent captures its own characteristics. Under such mechanism, uh, agent's individual state can be determined by its uh, virtual range and uh, topological relationship with its uh, labors. Each agent will determine topological distance relationship with its neighbor agents, following the rules of exclusion, maintain, attraction, and deviation. Also, to obtain neighborhood states, we introduce the local attention mechanism that agent observes is a K neighborhood selection using topological distance to determine topological relationship among agents. Agent only interacts with its K neighbors within its perception range. So we use the topological distance to determine topological relationship among agents. That is called fixed the lambda of a neighborhoods. And the local attention mechanism agents the local optimal position can be integrated by optimal positions of the selected neighbors. Based on different attention information obtained, these attentions can be aligned according to the prior and aligned target attention state is merged in output layer, which provides the help for agent to further obtain update strategy. Artificial potential field is regarded that object in environment as a particle in virtual force field, which can decide the forces agent sustains including attraction force from the goal, force from its neighbor agents, repulsion force from its close neighbors, or attraction force from far neighbors. We can obtain the composition of each force of agent. Based on our proposed method, we implement a flock of a stalling optimization algorithm called Stalling OPT. 
Here is the flowchart of this algorithm. Step 1. Initialize state and action of each agent. Step 2. For each agent, observe the individual state and the neighborhood state and align the states. Choose action. Step 3. Evaluation moves to a new state and the reward or penalty associated with the transaction is determined. Step 4. Calculate repulsion force, attraction force, and composition force. Step 5. Update Q using Benjamin accrution. The loop is repeated until reaching the target state or reaching the maximum iteration. We handled some experiments on the three aspects, including parameter analysis, effectiveness analysis, and also algorithm comparison. For the parameter analysis, we analyzed the effects of some key parameters like number of agents, forced factor, upper limit of stops, and the number of neighbors on the algorithm efficiency. Rosenbrock is used for multimodal test function. These are the analysis results of these parameters. As we can see, number of agents is not directly related to the solution to the program. When force factor is 0 0.1, the algorithm may have the best efficiency of solution using the less number of uh, iterations to obtain the optimal solution of the function. When upper lip is 2, solving efficiency of the algorithm is improved. Therefore, upper lip of stops can be set to 2. When k is 6 or 7, the algorithm is the most efficient, which also verifies the characteristic of a topological interaction of a flock of starlings. For the effectiveness analysis, these are the results which show that our Starling OPT can find the optimal function results for both unimodal function and multimodal function, which is a universal in solving function programs. In addition, we compare solution efficiency and the running time among PSO, FSO, Starling PSO, and our algorithm for multimodal function. As we can see from this finger, except FSO, the others can find the optimal solution. Our algorithm is obviously more efficient than Starling PSO and PSO. Also, our Starling OPT has the highest success rate among other algorithms, reaching 100%, which represent that it can find the optimal value whether it's in unimodal or multimodal. We verified the effectiveness of our algorithm on the benchmark functions and also compared it with PSO, FSO, and Starling PSO. The experimental results show that our algorithm can effectively improve the capability and efficiency to find the optimal solution, including unimodal and multimodal situation. To solve the issue of a low efficiency of the current PSO with Starling flock behavior, we propose our flock of Starling optimization algorithm with reinforcement learning capability. The algorithm combines the theory of a reinforcement learning with attention mechanism and aligns the attentions at each time step to make agent pay more attention to the variable movement state, which can access range learning speed in the optimization process and let agent make better decision. Our first work show combine the attention 
mechanism with some more kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms and adopt certain strategies to optimize the default rewards, which can make our algorithm more conducive to learning by reinforcement learning algorithm. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any suggestions or comments to me, please feel free to contact me. Hi everyone, I am Sayyid Kaisar Jali and today I am presenting our paper titled as a deep reinforcement learning approach to fair distributed dynamic spectrum access. I'll start my presentation with the introduction. So as we all know that radio spectrum is a scarce resource and as projected by Cisco report, mobile data traffic demand is growing exponentially. Now to meet the ever growing demand of future wireless networks, we need to efficiently exploit the underutilized radio spectrum resources. One of the potential technology that can achieve this is cognitive radio network. Cognitive radio network consists of primary and secondary network. In a primary network, we have primary users, which are the licensed owner of the spectrum. And then in the secondary network, we have secondary users, which opportunistically access license spectrum with the requirement of no or limited harmful interference to primary users. Secondary users, can work in centralized or distributed fashion. So in this study, our goal is to consider a distributed cognitive radio network with the assumptions that there are multiple primary users, there are multiple license channels, there are multiple secondary users, and secondary users do not have prior information about the activity pattern of the primary users. And then we also assume that there is no coordination between primary network and secondary network. And finally, no coordination among secondary users. This means that while accessing the channel, uh, while accessing the channel, secondary users do not coordinate with each other, each other. And this makes, this assumption makes the problem really complex. And this makes it really difficult to achieve a, f a fairness in the system in terms of accessing the spectrum, idle spectrum resources. Now, the goal is to derive, derive a set of policies for secondary users such that they avoid collision with primary users, they avoid collision with other secondary users, and then they deal with different PU activity patterns and they deal with spectrum sensing errors. And finally, they should be able to fairly access spectrum resources. Now, to mathematically formulate our system model, we have K number of primary users, each operating in a unique license channel and the set of channel uh, set of license channels therefore is denoted with this uh, with the set k and the secondary network consists of n number of secondary users again we are assuming that there is no coordination between primary and secondary network and there is no coordination among secondary users for pu activity pattern we consider on off pu activity model in which we have on and off uh, off periods and these on off periods follows a Poisson distribution and are exponentially distributed. Now the channel utilization rate is is, is, is uh, denoted as mu and finally for spectrum sensing uh, we consider that we can use any spectrum sensing method and the spectrum sensing errors uh, are denoted with in terms of probability of misdetection and probability of false alarm. We do not explicitly mention the spectrum sensing method uh, since the focus of this study is not to consider spectrum sensing methods. Therefore, we can use any spectrum sensing method from literature such as energy detection method, match filter, or any of the recent state-of-the-art spectrum sensing methods. Again, our goal is to derive set of policies that learn to avoid collision with PU, SU, deal with different PU activity patterns, deal with spectrum sensing errors and fairly access spectrum without any coordination. To achieve this, we propose a deep reinforcement learning based solution. Now, we briefly explain about the 
re working principle of reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning is a field of machine learning in which an agent interacts with the environment and tries to learn its behavior. As it can be seen in the figure, an agent issues an action which is executed in the environment. And when it is executed in the environment, environment moves to the new state. And then uh, based upon the action, a reward is also generated, which can be positive or negative. And both of these state and reward is given back to the agent. And by, by working in this loop, reinforcement learning algorithm learn. One of the widely used reinforcement learning algorithm is a Q learning. However, using a Q learning for our problem is not suitable because Q learning cannot work uh, Q, Q learning has limitation in terms of scalability and memory complexity. Therefore, we use a deep reinforcement learning methods. Now, for deep reinforcement learning method, one of the pioneer work was proposed by DeepMind, where they combined deep neural network with Q learning, and they uh, they they achieved superhuman performance on many different Atari games. Since then, many extensions to deep Q network have been proposed which led to further performance improvements such as double DQ and dwelling deep Q network with prioritized experience replay. In terms of multi-agent deep reinforcement learning, one of the simple yet scalable approach is to use independent Q learning in which each agent, we have multiple agent setting and each agent ignores the presence of other agent and tries to learn as the other, as the uh, uh, tries to ignore the presence of other agents and then try to learn the system behavior. And in this way, all the agents learn in an evolutionary way. So we consider independent Q learning in our case, and we assume that we consider that each agent is uh, is using dwelling double deep Q network with prioritized experience replay, and we call it as D3QN prioritized experience replay. Now. For the working of any deep reinforcement learning, we first need to design state space, action space, and reward function. For state space, for each agent, we assume that the state space consists of the following, that it consists of the current state of each channel that is sensed by the spectrum sensing module, and the previous M historic observation. So with, by using the historic M observation of each channel, the SU can learn the different PU activity patterns. And then we uh, separate each channel with the uh, minus one in the state space vector. And the state of each channel can be either zero or one, where zero denotes there is no primary user present and one denotes the presence of the primary user. For the action space vector, for the nth SU, the action space vector is from 0 to k, where 1 to k denotes the number of channels, and 0 denotes the case where SU remains silent and opted not to transmit. This can be to this action can be selected to either let other SUs transmit, that is to fairly access the spectrum, or if all of the channels are being used by the primary user at that time. Now, the third thing is the reward function. Reward function is one of the most critical part of the deep reinforcement learning algorithms. Now, to design the reward function, we first define some mathematical notation. First one is this the indicator function, where we, we, which gives us the value of one if the S and SU performs successful transmission at time slot t, and otherwise zero. And the total successful transmission of nth SU until time slot t is defined as the Zn of t, which is the summation of the indicator function until time slot t. And then the successful transmission of all n SUs until time slot t is stored in a vector of z of t until time slot t. And this is this is used in a rescaling function, which is shown here. Now the rescaling function is this small z dash of n which is the uh, end up to the time slot t with the lower and upper limits q and p. Now, if uh, if nth su selects an action, so there are five different possibilities. Now, let's assume that the nth su selected kth channel at t time slot. Now, the first case would be if this transmission was successful, then 
the reward will be allocated as follows. If the case channel is free and is not accessed by any other SU, this means that the transmission was successful. However, this can there can be different cases where only one SU can be transmitting all the time and the remaining SU can be silent and they did not perform any transmission. So this is not what we want. To avoid this, for this case, we use the reward function of one. If all the SUs have same number of transmission, that this means that all SUs have transmitted the same number of times. So there is fairness in the system. Otherwise, the negative of the rescaling function will be given with the uh, with the q equal minus one and p is equals to one, which means that if the selected uh, if the nth SU has the highest number of successful transmission already, so it will be given a reward of minus one which will encourage it to remain silent for the next time slot. Otherwise, if the selected, uh, if the nth SU has the least number of successful transmission, it will be given a reward of one, which means that it will be encouraged to perform further transmissions. The next case would be if nth SU selected case channel and it resulted in SU to PU collision. Since SU to PU collision has the highest priority and we want to avoid it as much as possible, we given a reward of minus 1.6. Now this minus 1.6 is carefully designed because we have used rescaling function, the reward value in, in our reward function, the reward value remains between minus one and one. So for these two cases of SU to PU and SU to SU collision, we given a value of uh, more than minus 1.6, which means that since SU to PU collision has the highest priority, we give an a reward of minus 1.6. And then for SU to SU collision, since it has uh, it, it is less important compared to the SU to PU collision, we give an a reward of minus 1.1. Now for the case when and SU opted to select opted to opted uh, action zero, which means that if all the PUs are currently utilizing channels, this means that there is no free channel, then the reward will be plus one for the nth, uh, for the nth SU at time slot T. Otherwise, it can remain silent to let other SU perform transmission. This is to ensure the fairness aspect. Now, if the nth SU, we, we use the uh, rescaling function here, with the limit minus one and zero, which means that if the select, if the nth SU has the highest number of successful transmission and for the current time slot T, it's selected to remain silent, then it will be uh, given a reward of zero, which means that it is not being penalized. Otherwise, if the nth SU has selected the uh, uh, action zero, which is to remain silent, then it will be given a reward of minus one, such that in the next time slot, it choose to, uh, to perform transmission such that in the system we can ensure the fairness aspect. So this is the reward function. Now for the performance evaluation, we consider four different deep reinforcement learning method and in which the first one is a deep Q network with naive reward. In literature, in most of the recent studies, the, the, reward, the reward function is used is a simple and we call it naive reward in which in, in a re naive reward if an SU performs successful transmission it will be given a reward of plus one. If the, uh, the transmission was not successful it was it will be given a reward it was given a reward of minus one. So this is the naive reward with the DQN and then we have three other methods one is DQN all the remaining method use the proposed reward function DQN and then the proposed function uh, proposed um, uh, method with the D3QN prioritized experience replay and finally proximal policy optimization that is called PPO. To show the fine grained details of each SU in terms of fairness, success rate and different performance metrics that we'll explain in the next slide, we consider five SUs with three channels and these three channels have different PU activity patterns as it can be seen in the table. So there are three channels, two are long term activity to have uh, two Two, uh, two channels follows long-term activity pattern and one follows low-term activity pattern. So the first channel has utilization of approximately 66%, the second one is 10%, and the finally low-term activity has channel has the channel utilization rate of 16%. 
Now, in terms of performance metrics, we consider five different metrics that show the details, fine grain details of each SU. The first one is the success rate, which shows the successful transmission of each SU. Then we show the SU to PU collision rate, SU to SU collision rate, and then we have action zero, incorrect action zero, which means that the SUs remained silent or opted action zero. However, there was at least one channel available for transmission. So that means that the idle resource went wasted. And the final performance metric is the channel utilization rate, which shows the utilization of idle slots of each channel. So the first case is we perform evaluation when there was no spectrum sensing error. That is the probability of misdetection and false alarm was zero. So the first in the first figure, we show the success rate in the, on the x-axis we have uh, each SU and finally we have the average of all SUs and on y-axis the success rate is represented. Now you can see that the DQN with naive reward here for both SU1 and SU4 did not really transmit most of the time while SU3 and SU5 transmit most of the time and SU1 and SU4 did not transmit. So in a real world application, this is not feasible. That all, all of the time, few of the uh, SUs perform transmission while other SUs remain silent. And the proposed method, as you can see here, this one is the proposed method. In for all SUs, it almost achieve the success rate, the channel X. Um, now in this legend, uh, this orange, line here this shows the channel access and the and the uh, sorry the orange line shows the remain silent and blue is the channel access so you can see that the proposed method was able to achieve approximately every su uh, uh, successfully access the channel 40 percent of the time and you can see here that this is the average of all su's now you can see that both dq and with naive reward that is a simple reward not difficult to learn and the proposed method with the uh, proposed reward function, they almost achieve the similar success rate. However, in terms of fairness, the proposed method was far better than the DQN with naive reward. And with the other two methods, DQN with the proposed method and proposed reward function and PPO with the reward function, our method clearly outperformed them. Now, in terms of SU to PU collision rate, as you can see that DQN with naive reward, almost no SU to PU collision because most of the time, most of the users remain silent. So there was no SU to PU collision rate. In our case, the uh, uh, the SU to PU collision rate was less than 1%. So that is not really bad considering that there is no coordination among users. And then the third parameter was SU to SU collision rate. Since SU to SU collision rate has less priority and it has less penalty in terms of reward, therefore it is more compared to SU to PU collision rate. However, it is still under 13, uh, it is uh, still um, less than um, 2%, so it is still not that bad. And uh, compared to other methods, it is far better. And uh, then incorrect action zero, as you can see that it is less than uh, 5%, so it is still better, considering it ensures fairness in the system. And finally, we have channel utilization rate. It can be seen that both DQ and naive reward and the proposed method achieve same uh, channel utilization rate. They, they utilize the channel uh, in, uh, equally. However, the proposed method achieve fairness, which is really hard considering the uh, coordination aspect, no coordination aspect. Now, the second case is here is with the spectrum sensing error. That is, we have probability of misdetection 0.2 and probability of false alarm of 0.2. This means that the, the there's a 40% spectrum sensing error. Now you can see that the overall success rate, overall performance of each method has decreased due to spectrum sensing error. Even the, with these spectrum sensing error, you can see that the proposed method is able to achieve fairness in the system, even though the performance is slightly less than the DQN naive reward. However, it, it again makes sure the fairness aspect in the system and for the SU to PU collision rate it is less than four percent it is still not that bad considering that it ensured the fairness in the system and then SU to SU collision rate 
it is less than 2%. And then incorrect action, zero rate, it is less than 30%. Now, this is slightly higher. Why? Because in this case, we have spectrum sensing errors. And since the, inform the input information given is not correct, therefore, it, try, it, it shows that the SUs are trying to uh, trying different, uh, trying to ensure fairness aspect, and that is why there were more incorrect actions, zero rate. And then finally, we have channel utilization rate, where you can see that the performance has decreased slightly, but still it ensures fairness aspect, and there is, uh, there is, uh, uh, it also uh, the SU to PU and SU to SU collision is not that bad. So therefore, the proposed method can be used in real world applications where it can ensure fairness along with other uh, uh, other benefits. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for attending. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Thanks. Hi, I'm Vasish Dudu and I'm currently a graduate student in the University of Waterloo. Uh, our work titled Towards Enhancing Fault Tolerance in Neural Networks was done during my undergraduate in Indraprastha Institute of Information Technology in Delhi, India. Uh, this work is done in collaboration with Dr. Vijay Rao from the Indian Defense Research and Development Organization and Professor Valentina Balas from the University of Arad in Romania. Here's an overview of my presentation. I will briefly introduce uh, the problem of reliable deep learning and its importance for safety critical applications. I will then describe the fault model that we consider in our work and describe the shortcomings of prior research uh, to inherently enhance the fault tolerance of neural networks. We then show that regularization is a scalable approach and uh, based on that, we propose an R algorithm uh, to enhance the neural network's inherent fault tolerance. Uh, finally, I, dis I will describe the experimental setup and the results from our evaluation before concluding the talk. Reliable deep learning is uh, becoming important with different applications for neural networks that are being currently explored. Um, for instance, uh, neural networks are being considered for deployment in several safety critical applications such as autonomous vehicles and uh, these uh, neural networks are, are executed on specialized hardware accelerators and neuromorphic systems uh, which, uh, which again are required to operate for a very long duration without any human intervention. As a result of wear and tear, uh, the hardware is prone to faults which uh, invariably results in errors in the neural network application. This can be addressed in two ways. One is to design uh, fault tolerant hardware and the other is to design the neural networks to be inherently reliable and fault tolerant. In this work, we consider the second approach of uh, designing and training a neural network to be inherently fault tolerant. Uh, fault tolerance uh, is a property where the neural network continues to operate in the presence of node and synapse faults and uh, degrades gracefully over time. We consider the uh, definition of uh, epsilon fault tolerance, which has been uh, explored before, where, which requires the computation of the faulty neural network to be close to the neural network without any faults. And this notion of closeness is given by uh, a value epsilon, error, which, is, which describes the error between the computation of both. And for complete fault tolerance, the value of epsilon is uh, required to be zero. But this requirement can be relaxed for neural networks which are uh, uh, which degrade gracefully uh, in which case epsilon can be greater than zero so in this work we consider the case of stuck at zero faults which is a frequently considered case in literature which makes it easy for comparison as well as uh, it is important for the upcoming applications such as uh, neural network accelerators and neuromorphic hardware uh, the, the reason this is uh, more practical is uh, that these accelerators have an array of computational units to compute the multiply accumulate operations, uh, which is basically the matrix vector multiplications typically done uh, in neural networks. And um, any fault in the uh, multiply accumulate unit will result in multiple concurrent stuck at zero errors in the neural network. 
uh, neural networks uh, nodes across different layers. All of the nodes which are then mapped to the faulty ma uh, MAC unit are likely to uh, stuck at uh, give us a con consistent zero value. Uh, the second is the case of uh, stuck at zero parameters, which can occur when we are unable to fetch parameters from the memory. Uh, in order to in inject faults uh, and simulate uh, the errors in the neural network computation uh, for both parameters and nodes, uh, we generate a random binary mask uh, which zeroes out a fraction of parameter values or the node activation values uh, and hence uh, forcing them to be stuck at zero. So first we will consider the uh, uh, and explore the prior work that has uh, a, that exists in this line of research. Uh, and we want to understand what are the f uh, shortcomings of uh, the prior work and uh, how can we improve that for the current state of the art architectures. So one approach is to consider the traditional fault tolerance uh, techniques uh, coming from reliability engineering, which includes uh, techniques like n-modular uh, redundancy, where uh, we can replicate the neural network multiple times and use a voting strategy to obtain the uh, best outcome from all the models. Um, while this is possible in several applications, it is not suitable for res uh, resource constrained systems. Um, secondly, uh, augmenting redundancy by uh, reducing the load of uh, computationally uh, heavy nodes and synapses uh, by adding uh, additional units is not practical for large DNNs which are already overparameterized. The second approach is that of constrained optimization, which consider fa considers fault tolerance as a constraint during training. Uh, and several approaches such as min-max uh, genetic algorithms have been explored and been and have been solved using quadratic programming. Um, however, these techniques are typically considered simple toy example uh, examples for neural networks and are computationally expensive to solve and not scalable to the current state of the art architectures with millions of parameters. Um, further, these approaches re uh, result in partial fault tolerance. Uh, because of this uh, computational expensive nature and approximating that computation. Finally, we consider the case of regularization, which is important for us because uh, this approach is, uh, is pos potentially scalable to large state-of-the-art architectures that we want to consider. So, uh, Tikhonov and Lasso regularization, also uh, known as L2 and L1 uh, regularization, uh, restrict the parameters from overfitting to training uh, data. And as seen in the table, we see that as uh, increasing the regularization uh, hyperparameter in the loss uh, objective uh, of uh, the neural network training, we find that the testing accuracy decreases uh, with a decrease in generalization error. So generalization error here is used as a metric to estimate overfitting and high generalization error indicates uh, more overfitting and hence low fault tolerance. So our goal here is to uh, find a better fault tolerance and accuracy trade-off uh, by regularizing the neural network strongly. We want to understand why regularization is a good approach for enhancing fault tolerance. And uh, in order to ex uh, understand that, we, we train a model with regularization and without regularization and plot the parameter values. And we find that the parameter values for the regularized model are within a very small uh, standard deviation. Uh, on the other hand, the unregularized model are spread across different parameter values. Because of this, uh, we, we can see that the regularized models uh, consider all the nodes equally important uh, because of the similar para parameter values for the computation in the next layer. On the other hand, unregularized model, uh, because of the variable parameter values, uh, are likely to have some of the nodes to be more important as, uh, as compared to others. So on introducing faults, um, it's likely that the, uh, so, so as expected, we see that the regularized model uh, ha degrades gracefully. And uh, the reason for this is that the faults in nodes or parameters are compensated by uh, other nodes in the network since all of the nodes are equally important. On the other hand, for unregularized models, uh, if the faults occur in some of the important nodes, then the accuracy degradation is significant. 
Based on our observations, our goal is to enhance the inherent fault tolerance of neural networks without a significant accuracy degradation. To this extent, we propose a two-phase training algorithm which separates the neural network into two different components based on the difference in functionality and objective. Uh, the first component is that of the feature extractor network which has an unsupervised learning objective to identify and extract the dominant features of the input. Uh, the second component of fully connected network has a supervised learning objective to map the intermediate features to the correct classification label. Uh, to this extent, uh, the training of neural network using a, sim a single supervised objective as done previously is insufficient to optimally train the individual network components. So uh, the first phase in involves unsupervised pre-training of the feature extractor, which is done using two games. The first game uh, is to identify and extract the robust features and the second game uh, has the goal of distributional smoothening for intermediate feature space. Uh, once the feature extractor is trained, it is combined with the fully connected network and the entire network is fine tuned for uh, satisfying the supervised objective using the two cl uh, true classification labels. So we uh, start with our uh, detailed description of unsupervised pre-training of the feature extractor. And as described before, the goal here is to identify and extract the dominant features from input images. And this is done uh, using two neural networks with all conflicting ob objectives and uh, where the feature extractor wants to identify and extract the dominant features for a given input image, while the generative model aims to reconstruct the input uh, uh, back given the feature extracted by the uh, feature extractor. This is done by minimizing the uh, reconstruction loss, uh, by minimizing the difference between the uh, true input and the reconstructed input. And uh, both the networks are trained jointly uh, to learn the identity function with feature extracted as an encoder and the generator model as a decoder. Now we consider the second game of the unsupervised pre-training of the feature extractor where the goal is to ensure distributional smoothness of the extracted robust features. And in order to address this, we want to ensure that uh, the extracted features follow a Gaussian distribution to avoid any gaps in the feature space, which might result in uh, mapping inputs to features which are not truly representative of the underlying distribution. Uh, in order to do that, we consider the min-max game uh, between the feature extractor and the discriminator, where the discriminator uh, discriminator's goal is to distinguish the output from the feature extractor and the sampled uh, output from the uh, true distribution. And uh, via the min-max game, we want to find a solution where both players take their best action. And uh, to that extent, the optimization that we consider is uh, that of minimizing the error between feature extractors generated features and the target uh, true distribution samples. Uh, and one way to look at this is to maximize the discriminator's error or minimize the discriminator's gain where the discriminator's gain is the reward that the discriminator gets on correctly distinguishing between the features output and data points from the two uh, data distribution. So the entire objective uh, can be thought of as a fault tolerant minimax construct, uh, constraint over the feature space unlike the previous work which considered the uh, fault tolerance uh, constraint over the output predictions. Uh, as seen in the images on the side, we, uh, the, the models on training indicate uh, the minimax behavior that we described. Now we consider the supervised fine tuning or the second phase of our training approach. So the pre-training ensures that the feature extractor uh, extracts robust input features which is close to the Gaussian distribution and this unsupervised pre-training of the feature extractor uh, results in a strong uh, regularization of the model. For the supervised optimization, uh, we combine the fully connected network with the uh, feature extractor and the fully connected map network maps the outputs of the feature extractor uh, to the corresponding classification class. Um, in order to do that, we minimize the classification loss between the predicted and true output uh, labels. As part of the experiment setup, we consider two metrics for uh, evaluation. 
uh, the first is generalization error which estimates the extent of overfitting and here it is used as a measure of fault tolerance. The generalization error is estimated as the difference between the train and test accuracy and larger the gap between train test accuracy more is the overfitting indicating low reliability. Uh, the second metric that we consider is that of test accuracy uh, where uh, we want to understand the performance degradation on introducing faults. So as part of our baselines, we consider two regularization techniques which have been explored extensively in prior fault tolerant literature. The first is lasso regularization, which uh, is the loss function in addition to the regularization function as the absolute sum of parameter values. Uh, Tikhonov regularization on the other hand uh, uses the regularization function as the sum of square of parameter values. Uh, several regularization techniques uh, have been theoretically shown to be equivalent to Lasso and Tikhonov as a result making these important baselines. So for our evaluation we, we consider two data sets. Uh, one is Fashion MNIST data set uh, which is a 28 tw cross 28 uh, grayscale images belonging to 10 classes and the second and more larger data set is the CIFAR 10 data set with uh, 32 cross 32 RGB images again belonging to 10 classes. We consider two architectures of different sizes for each of the data sets uh, to see if the algorithm scales well. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, accuracy and generalization error, we find that the proposed algorithm has the lowest generalization error and better test accuracy compared to other previously appro uh, proposed approaches, indicating that uh, the approach, uh, the proposed approach provides a better trade-off between accuracy and generalization error. Um, in order to understand the performance degradation on injecting faults, uh, we consider three fault uh, settings. The first being faults in the nodes, the second in parameters, and finally the filters in case of convolutional layers. Uh, we find that the proposed model uh, tolerates faults better than the previously uh, uh, proposed Lasso and Tikhonov regularization techniques and the resulting models trained with our uh, training algorithm provides graceful degradation. So to summarize, in this work we propose a game theoretic framework for training uh, neural networks and enhance their inherent fault tolerance. Uh, we consider a two-phase training approach by splitting the network into two components based on the different functionality and training objective and uh, the first uh, network component is the feature extractor with an unsupervised learning objective and the second uh, component is the fully connected network with a supervised learning objective. Uh, we train the networks uh, together for optimizing their respective objectives instead of using a single supervised objective for both the networks and the resultant model is tolerant to faults with good accuracy compared to uh, prior approaches which is Lasso and Tikhonov. With that I would like to conclude my talk and I thank you for listening. Hello everyone, welcome to the presentation on movement and orientation visualization using wearable inertial sensors. Wearable sensors are used for activity and movement recognition that have important applications in many areas like healthcare, elderly monitoring, context recognition and so on. Most of the solutions available today are data driven. So, understanding the data is a fundamental requirement toward developing effective and efficient solutions. We know that visualization is the most effective approach to get better insight into and better understand the data. However, novel visualization methods are rarely invented. A new method that would provide additional utility and additional insights in addition to the existing methods is very desirable. We have developed a new method for visualizing movement and orientation of devices using inertial sensors. Our method is based on quaternion that represents the orientation of the device with respect to the world 
coordinates. Quaternions are calculated combining data from accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. <coughs> the quaternion values depend on the direction. That means if we perform the same activity but facing different directions, then quaternion values will be different. In most cases, direction does not matter. We want to detect the activities or gestures independent of direction. So we use rotation matrix which is equivalent to the unit quaternion. The rotation matrix is orthogonal. That means rows and columns of the matrix are orthonormal unit vectors. The first row of the matrix represents the orientation with respect to earth east, the second row with respect to north, and the third row represents gravity along the different axis of the device. In most cases, we need direction independent activity recognition or movement visualization. But there are cases where direction provides additional information. For example, opening two doors that are similar but facing in different direction. In this case, information about direction would be very important to understand and distinguish opening these two doors. For direction independent cases, we use the third row of the matrix that is the gravity vector. We can additionally use the east or north vectors where direction is important. In this presentation, we mainly focus on direction independent activity recognition. That means we mainly focus on the gravity vectors. As mentioned before, rows of the rotation matrix are unit vectors and they are 3D. So we can place them on the surface of a unit sphere. If we place the time series sequence of the vectors on the sphere, we get the trace of the orientation of the device. The orientation trace on the unit sphere is the fundamental primitive of our visualization methods. For different activities, the orientation traces are limited to specific areas of the sphere. We call this area orientation disability for that activity. Here, we see the orientation disability of a risk device for opening doors and brushing teeth. For brushing teeth, orientation of the wrist does not change that much, but acceleration can change significantly based on how fast or slow the activity is performed. Here we see significant variance in acceleration based on speed, but the gravity vectors do not change significantly because the gravity vectors present the orientation irrespective of speed. If we visualize on a sphere, we get better insight about the orientation of the wrist during the activities. Here we see the orientation disability is limited to a small area for brushing teeth. We can use this property to distinguish activities more accurately and efficiently. Though gravity vectors do not change significantly based on speed, due to difference in duration of the activity, time series representations are different. For example, here we see gravity data for two apple bytes. One is slow and another is fast. It is difficult to understand that are from the same gestures. I mean that are from similar gestures from this time series representation. In contrast, if we plot them or the, if we plot the gravity vectors on the 3D sphere, we can see that the traces are similar. So from this, we can get better insights about the movement and orientation than the traditional time series representation. If you notice, you will see that the X and Y axis in these two figures are not aligned. We have to rotate the sphere for brushing teeth, I mean the figure on the right side, to bring the trace in front side of our visualization. So this representation on the sphere is not sufficient to understand exactly where the trace is. 
So we divide the sphere into some nearly uniform cells to better understand the orientation trace and disability. For that purpose, we use icosahedron. An icosahedron is a polyhedron with 20 equilateral triangular faces and 12 vertices, where the vertices lie on the surface of a unit sphere. The cells are then defined by the Voronoi diagram generated from the vertices. That means if we take Voronoi cell around each of the uh, vertices, we use their cells to pinpoint the traces. The problem, the problem with the cells generated from the icosahedron is that the cells are big. You see here that the size of the cells are very big. And so different activities, I mean traces from different activities would fall in the same cell, making it difficult to distinguish their disability or their trace for different activities. We generate smaller cells by dividing each triangular faces into four triangles and taking Voronoi cells for each of the vertices. You see here <coughs> that we divide the uh, triangular face of the icosahedron into four triangles each for each of the face. Then we generate Voronoi region around each of the vertices. This gives us more smaller cells. Actually, we can repeat this process and we can get more smaller cells. In this figure, K represents how many times we have repeated the process or we have divided the triangular faces. Just dividing the cell is not sufficient. We need to identify each of the cells. So, we provide a unique number to each of the cells to understand exactly in what cells the orientation goes. One important property of cell numbering is that even if we divide the cells into a smaller, the numbering from bigger cells remain in the same. Here we see that numbers from k equals 2 remain in the same place for k equals 3. We can view the trace with different granularity of the, sorry, we can view the trace with different granularity of the cells with connecting the insides from bigger to smaller cells and vice versa. The number of cells can be defined by k with the formula 10 multiplied by 4 to the power k plus 2. We will now present how we can use our method to develop an efficient solution for a smoking gesture detection. We have used a public data set that has data for different activities like eating, walking, drinking and smoking. <coughs> First, let's see how the orientation looks like for different activities. Can you see the orientation trace as well as disability for different activities? We can see different properties of the data. For example, a smoking while standing has longer trace than a smoking while sitting. Please look in the x-y axis of the figures to better understand where a figure has been rotated to bring the traces in front for visualization. During a smoking, the wrist goes up and then down. And so the gravity vectors go down and then up as shown in the figure here. Please note that similar patterns are also generated for confounding activities like drinking and eating. To find such gestures, we cut the data using a threshold and take the middle points of the segments. This point represents the moment around which movements for smoking, drinking or similar activities occur. We discard most of the data using the threshold and focus only in relevant segments in the data. Now to detect smoking from other similar segments, we use a convolutional neural network 
that is similar to another word used for eating gesture detection. Please note that our focus of this paper is not to develop new machine learning classifier for smoking detection, but how we can use our method to detect smoking more efficiently. Though we discard most of the data using the threshold based method <coughs> and use neural networks only for the relevant segments of the data, we know that neural networks require much more computation than some simple thresholds. We can further reduce computation and make the solution more efficient by discarding more points using another simple threshold based on our visualization technique. If we look into the orientation disability for a smoking and define the area, then we can discard many non-smoking data before using neural network. Here we see that we can discard significant portion of eating data just by using orientation disability. Please note that activities like walking would be almost discarded by this method. And so we do not have to use computationally expensive neural networks for most part of the data, making our solution very efficient. Now, if we make the area smaller, we would discard more non-smoking data but data for smoking would also be discarded, resulting in more false negative. We should trade off between accuracy and efficiency. Here we show the precision, recall and F1 score for retaining different percentiles of the smoking data. For example, if you retain 90% of the smoking data, the F1 score reduces by 0.015 but we can discard 28% of the data before using neural networks. We can gain significant efficiency with a small reduction in accuracy, which could be very useful for on-device processing for devices like smart watches, where the resources are very limited. So we can use our method to trade up between efficiency and accuracy. Here we show another application of our method. Our methods can be used to monitor and better understand rehab exercises. The pattern on the sphere can be used to understand the movement intensity as well as anomaly if there is any. So for example, if we see some anomaly in the data or in the, in the visualization that we proposed, we can understand that there are some problem with the patient. So this kind of monitoring would be very important or very useful for healthcare and rehab exercise monitoring. So in summary, activity recognition or monitoring is not the focus of this paper. Rather, we demonstrate how our method can be useful for this task. And the methods we presented in this paper are not activity specific. They can be used to develop more effective and efficient solutions for different activity detection and monitoring tasks. Another important point is that our methods are complementary, not replacement to existing methods. We should use these methods along with existing methods. That means our methods will provide additional utility and additional insights in addition to the existing methods. The methods in this paper are, can be used for initial sensors in general, like orientation or movement of objects. Though we have mainly presented using uh, wearable sensors and for mainly activity recognition, but the methods are not limited for activity recognition and wearable sensors. It can be actually used for any inertial sensor-based work. We strongly believe that the methods presented in this paper would have significant contribution to future research and development works with inertial sensors. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Hannes Bergqvist and I will present our paper Positioning with Map Matching Using Deep Neural Networks. This is a joint work with Sony R&D Center Europe and Malmö University. My co-authors are Paul Davidson and Peter Exner. There are a wide range of methods for positioning. This work focuses on method for static positioning, where the objective is to compute a single location estimate from several simultaneously taken measurements, independent of previous or future measurements or estimates. Popular approaches are iteratively square, particle filters or machine learning methods such as support vector machines and deep neural networks. Iteratively square or particle filters will work without training data, but are limited in the ability to adapt to complex environments. Machine learning methods need data and can adapt to complex environments to increase accuracy, but they are st still susceptible to the noisy characteristics of many sensors, which can result in invalid positions. Map matching is the task of matching geographical observations to a model of the real world. In many scenarios, domain information in form of maps are available. This can then be used to further improve position estimates. Common approaches are geometrical analysis, hidden Markov models or comma filters. And some recent work introduced deep learning models for map matching as well. For some methods, positioning and map matching can be done simultaneously. For example, particle filters for position estimation can also perform map matching by avoiding particles in invalid areas. But there are, as far as we know, no existing methods for positioning improved with map matching with a single neural network model. So the focus of this work is, can we achieve positioning and map matching with a single neural network model and thereby improve accuracy and reduce the number of invalid position estimates. The idea is to improve a neural network model for positioning with the use of map information. We do this in three ways. The first is a method for using map information as an additional input to the model. We then build on the idea that map matching can be viewed as a step for correcting misaligned position estimates. In a neural network setting, one way of constraining positions to geographical segments is by introducing an additional loss function. We introduce a map matching loss function based on map lookup and gradient interpolation. Further, we also use the map information when generating synthetic training data. In order to add map information to the input of a neural network, we first convert the map to a binary matrix with pixel value 0 for valid areas and 1 for invalid areas. The matrix is then vectorized and concatenated to the list of features. We expand the input layer of the model accordingly. Although this is a straightforward method, it works surprisingly well. The map matching loss function use the output of the model and the map in form of the binary matrix to return a loss based on where the output of the model, the predicted position estimate, is located on the map. As a first step, the binary matrix is used to generate a topographic matrix where invalid region pixel values are increased as a function of the distance to the closest valid region. We need to consider that the resolution of the topographic map is limited to the number of pixels, which might be less than the resolution of the position estimate. Additionally, the loss needs to have derivatives with respect to the position estimate. We achieve this by applying bilinear interpolation for the estimated position on the topographic map. This gives us a loss function that outputs a low or zero loss for valid positions and a higher loss for invalid positions with negative derivatives towards valid positions. In order to simultaneously train a model for both positioning and map matching with backpropagation, the mean square error and map matching loss functions 
or combined to form a total loss. Here, P represents the weighting between the losses. The most straightforward approach is to use a static weighting between the losses. A problem is to find the optimal value for P that avoids overfitting one of the tasks. In this work, we apply an adaptive weighting, where the mean square error loss acts as the primary loss while the map matching loss is introduced over time. Initially, P is uh, equal to 1, resulting in only mean square error loss. For every epoch, P is decreased or increased dependent on the positioning error. By introducing the map matching loss over time, we ensure learning a representation with low positioning error. The system used for collecting data for the experiments includes access points, beacons and a cloud service. The access points are based on Nordic Semiconductor's NRF52, including an ARM Cortex-M4 and a Bluetooth 2.4 GHz transceiver. The NRF52 is interfaced with an ESP32 for Wi-Fi capabilities. The mechanical design allows for easy mounting in power outlets. The beacons are also based on the NRF52, but without the ESP32 and powered from a battery. The beacons broadcast a unique identifier using the iBeacon protocol. The broadcasts are received by the access points. The RSSI and the broadcast together with the time and the beacon identity are registered. The access points are connected to a local Wi-Fi and communicates with the cloud service using the MQTT protocol. The registered data are published as an MQTT message once every 10 seconds. The web service subscribes to the message posted by the access points and stores the data to a database. The installation consists of 122 beacons and 42 access points mounted in a 750 square meters meter office environment as described in the figure. While previous work on machine learning for positioning has shown good results when trained and tested exclusively on either synthetic data or measured sensor data, we explore the important aspect of training as model on synthetic data while testing on measured sensor data from a real-world setting. Training on synthetic data is one key aspect in order to deploy a functioning system without extensive prior data collection. The training data is generated with a simple procedure. A training example is created by first generating a label position by drawing two samples from a uniform distribution. We then calculate the distances to all access points positions and add some Gaussian noise. The access points positions and the distances are combined to form the features. As a last step, some of the largest distances are removed. This is done to better generalize to real scenarios where access points at large distances often are out of reach. Two sets of training data are generated. The first covering all valid and invalid positions. The second with positions only in valid areas, excluding positions outside the building and inaccessible areas. This way, we utilize map information in the creation of synthetic training data. The data used for test and validation was collected in an office environment with the system and setup described at previous slide. The RSSI sensor measurements are converted to distances using the common path loss shadowing model, where PRX is the received power in decibel at distance d, PL0 is the path loss as the reference distance 1 meter, and eta is a constant depending on the environment. To validate our method for positioning with map matching, we perform five experiments. In the first, we train a baseline model on data covering all positions. This is the baseline where no map information is used. In the second experiment, we train the baseline model on data with only valid positions. This represents the improvement possible by simulating training data positions based on map information. In the third experiment, we introduce the map matching loss again trained on data covering only valid positions. 
This demonstrates the further improvements possible with a map-based loss function. The fourth experiment, we extend the input layer and add the map to the input data. This investigates the approach of utilizing map information as input data. Lastly, we run the training on data with valid positions with map input and map, map matching loss, thereby evaluating the use of map information in data generation, input data, and loss function combined. We evaluate the models by running inference on the test dataset. The positioning error is calculated as the L2 norm between the model inference output and the label of the data. Invalid position ratio is calculated as the percentage of the model inference outputs that are at invalid positions. In Table 1, parameters from the epoch with lowest positioning error on a subset of the training data is used. This represents the performance in scenarios when no measured sensor data are available before deployment. The results for experiment 1 and 5 are visualized in figure A and B. Experiment 1 has both the largest positioning error and largest percentage of invalid positions. In experiment 2, the map information in the training data reduces both positioning error and invalid positions. A large improvement is expected since no invalid positions are presented when training the model. The remaining invalid positions show the model's ability to generalize when unseen data are presented. The third experiment shows that it is possible to further improve on both positioning error and invalid positions by using the map matching loss. In experiment 4, the map as input to the model improves on positioning error and invalid positions compared to experiment 2. This demonstrates the model's ability to learn from multimodal input, even though the additional map input is consistent for all samples. The positioning error is the best of these experiments, although invalid positions are still at 6%. In experiment 5, the combined map input and map matching loss function reduces the invalid positions to the best result in this work. The result is an order of magnitude reduction in invalid positions compared to experiment 1, as well as a 20% decrease in positioning error. This improvement is clearly visible in figure B, where experiment 5 has no invalid positions estimates outside the building and only few invalid estimates inside seal of areas, which are the gray areas in the figure. So, we have presented how to improve positioning with map matching within a single neural network model. We showed how map information can be used as an additional input to a model to increase position accuracy and reduce the number of invalid positions. Further, we introduced a map matching loss function with map lookup and gradient interpolation. We presented several experiments validating our methods on real world RSSI data. The experiments demonstrate that these methods can be used, separate or combined, to significantly improve the performance of a neural network positioning model. The results show about 20% de decrease in positioning error and a decrease of one order of magnitude in the number of invalid positions. Future work includes evaluating the map matching loss function on deep learning models for other kinds of positioning, as well as other approaches for loss weighting. Thank you.
Good morning all. I am Akim Abed, Associate Professor at the University of Bourgogne-Franche-Comté. I will present here our work on optimization of rechargeable battery lifespan in wireless network protocols, a work carried out within the FAM2ST laboratory of the University of Bourgogne-Franche-Comté. Of course, interest in optimizing energy consumption continues to increase, and in particular in the field of information technology and communication, ETC. This optimization is a necessary condition for the ubiquity of mobile and wireless networks. In addition, the optimization of energy consumption in the field of computer technologies will participate in the reduction of the carbon footprint of ICTs, which represent 1.4% of the global carbon footprint linked to the human activities. This energy consumption relates to the different stages of the life cycle of the network equipment from production to the end of the life, including distribution and use, and use stages. Most of the work on energy optimization in network protocols focuses on reducing, on the, reducing the energy consumed in the short term. However, taking into account the impact of the actions of network protocols on the degradation of the state of health of the equipments, especially on the batteries, will be more relevant in the long term. The objective of this work is to present a new paradigm of energy optimization in radio networks, allowing to increase the lifespan of rechargeable batteries. We will illustrate the impact of this paradigm on a case study representing the problem of clustering in wireless sensor networks. We then compare our approach with other approaches from the literature in order to assess its performance. Conventional energy optimization approach in wireless networks can be broadly classified according to the nature of the batteries used, rechargeable or non-rechargeable. The approaches dedicated to non-rechargeable batteries define an evaluation function of the possible actions of the protocols according to the energy consumption such as, for example, reduction of the sum of energy consumed over all nodes of the network, or the reduction of the maximum amount of energy consumed by each node, or the reduction of the maximum amount of energy consumed by each node or the or maximization, sorry, or the third one, the maximization of the minimum energy remaining on the nodes. Or finally, simply the local or distributed reduction of the energy consumed by each node. Approaches dedicated to uh, rechargeable batteries are uh, rarer. Some approaches attempt to keep the level of the consumption, the level of consumption per node below the level of energy collection. Other approaches define the optimal use of mobile charger by the different nodes of the network. Other approaches try to define the best locations of the charger to recharge the node of the network. However, all of, the of these approaches relating to rechargeable batteries do not take into account the impact of the use profile of the node on the rate or the, the rapidity of degradation of the battery. In this work, we are interested in the phenomenon of degradation of the rechargeable battery. In the light of our studies established in the literature, we have opted for the following 
model described in this equation representing the state of health SOH. This value is computed according to four factors. The first one the first one represents the total of energy provided by the battery. The second one relates to the time factor, ST. The third one corresponds to the operating temperature. And the last one corresponds to the battery state of charge or charge level. It is therefore important to note that maintaining the battery at a high level of charge contributes to its rapid deterioration, like you see by this factor. This remark can be observed on the following example given in this figure, where we observe fast degradation of the uh, state of health during the time where the battery level is high. The introduction of the concept of battery degradation leads to a new way of defining the performance of a network protocol. In this new paradigm, the energy consumption evaluated locally or globally on the network is considered less important than the impact of the action of the protocol on the life of the battery. To illustrate this, let discuss about the following routing problem that consists in determining the best relay node to send the data from the node from the node S to the node D. Despite the central node is in good health, about 80%, this node should be avoided because its low residual energy of 5% exposes it to a risk of extinction which requires recharging time and an energy cost. Left and right nodes, left and right nodes have the same load level. It can be seen that the state of health of the left battery is better of about 66% against 50%. However, the left node has an overheated battery of about 50 degrees. The left node should therefore be left at rest because temperature is a rapid degradation factor, as we see uh, in the SOH evaluation function. To study the impact of this new paradigm on network protocol, we considered the problem of clustering in wireless sensor networks. Clustering is an organizational approach commonly used for sensor networks because it's, it allows a better management of sensor access to the network getaway, like in here. Each cluster is made up or composed of a cluster head and a cluster members. Communication between members, nodes, and their cluster head are carried out over a short range links, given in blue here. While communications between cluster heads and the getaway use long range links. As the load of the cluster heads become higher than it is sorry as the load of the cluster heads is higher than the member nodes it is necessary to regularly change the cluster heads in order to balance the load the problem is then 
to define in a distributed way at each round the cluster heats nodes. We have studied three approaches proposed in the literature, which are interesting because they are algorithmically identical and follow the same operational scheme described, described in this algorithm. The three approaches are leech, leech C, and E heat. At each round, each node calculates its own T value, then chosen or then choose with a probability of T to become a cluster heat. We describe here the three functions or the three different functions uh, for calculating T used by each approach. In leech, a node became cluster head if it has not been chosen as cluster head during the last one on PCH rounds with a probability that increases over the rounds. In leech C, In addition to not having been cluster hit for the last one divided on PCH rounds, the node must have a higher uh, charge level than the average load uh, or charge level. The average uh, charge level on the nodes is collected by the getaway and broadcasted at, e at the beginning of each round. In the heat approach, the probability of being cluster heat depends only on the load or the charge level of the node compared to the max level on the other nodes. This later is calculated by the getaway and broadcast at, to all the nodes at the start of each round. We have proposed an operating approach identical to the other methods in our approach called SOH Leach. However, the computation function of T takes into account the current load or the current state of charge of the node as well as its overall energy or its uh, uh, the sum of provided energy uh, since uh, the, 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 the device or the equipment is put into operation. Call it depth of discharge, DOD. However, at this point, the internal battery temperature, as we can see, is ignored. In the following table, we have studied three scenarios, which are distinguished by the traffic load generated by the nodes. 10,000 to 490,000 packets per round for the first scenario, and 10,000 to 109,000 packets per round at the second scenario and finally 100,000 packets up to 
300,000 packets per round for the third and uh, the third scenario. We clearly observe that our leech or uh, our SOH leech approach is better in terms of success rate, which represents the number of source packets reaching the getaway, as well as according to the estimated lifetime in number of rounds before the state of health of one of the nodes is less than 20%. The system is stopped when uh, at least one node reach uh, a value of SOH uh, uh, lower than 20%. The last case indicated here in bold indicates case where the success rate is degraded because SOH leach approach or leach SOH approach runs longer than the other. The success rate at the round 357 corresponding to the end of the simulation with the leech approach is about 51% for leech SOH method, okay, which is higher and bigger than the 54.3% for leech, which means that leech SOH approach is better than leech even for the leech as uh, even for uh, the the third scenario in this figure we show the state of health of the nodes of the simulated network or simulated sensor network under the conditions of the first scenario during the round one uh, eight hundred, we observe that leech SOH present the figure with the fewest colors. This expresses the good distribution of the degradation on the different notes. To conclude. While vehicle battery degradation models are integrated into transport systems, this notion remains ignored by the ETC community. This work presents a first attempt to take this phenomenon into account in radio network protocols. The idea is to optimize the lifespan of rechargeable batteries as a mean of reducing equipment replacement cycles. We have presented here a first case study associated with the clustering problem in wireless sensor network. We have implemented and compared three approaches from the literature with our approach, which takes into account my, um, the current state of charge of the batteries and the overall depth of discharge corresponding to the, um, the sum of energy provided by the battery. The results demonstrated the interest of this approach with a gain of around 28% over the lifetime of the network or the lifespan of the system. This work remains a first step in the process of taking battery degradation into account. It remains important to include the factors related to the operating temperatures of the battery as well as its average, uh, um, the, its average state of charge during its operational time. Thank you for listening.
to this presentation and goodbye. Hi everyone, I'm Asis Ronyar. I'm a PhD student at University of Oslo, Norway, and I'm here to present my paper title Exploiting Swift for IoT Noma based Diamond Relay Network, which has been accepted as a full paper for Moviquitas 2020 conference. This is the overview of my today's presentation. With the development of Internet of Things, a huge number of wireless devices and data transmission is expected. And the global data traffic is expected to reach up to 75 trillion gigabytes. With this massive expansion and connection of billions of such sensor nodes within the context of IoT and 5G is expected to consume more power. Therefore, it is challenging to address the energy efficiency of such IoT sensor nodes. Cooperative communication and relaying techniques are required to extend the coverage area and also to combat wireless fading. However, conventional relaying techniques requires the participating relaying nodes to spend extra energy for data transmission that may prevent the battery operated relay nodes to take an active part in relaying. Therefore, simultaneous wireless information and power transfer is considered as a promising energy efficient solution to combat the issue of powering massive IoT sensor and devices. Meanwhile, non orthogonal multiple access has been proposed as another key Key, key candidate for future 5G technology that allows multiple users, which can be multiplex in power domain for providing spectral efficiency and capacity gains. In NOMA, we have a uh, downlink and uplink NOMA. So here, let's talk about their working principle. In down, downlink NOMA, uh, base, uh, base system allocates different power to the users based on their distance. So here, user one is a near user, and user two is a far user. Here, base station allocates more power to the far user, that is user two, and less power to the near user, that is user one. At user one, it performs the SIC, uh, that is signal to interference cancellation of user two signal to decodes its own signal. For user two, it just consider user one signal as noise to decodes its own signal. On the other hand, in uplink NOMA, the near user, user one signal, is uh, likely to be strongest at the uh, base decision as compared to user two signal. Therefore, the base decision um, decodes the user one signal and then perform SIC of user one signal to decode user two signal. The contribution of this paper is a fourfold. We first propose and investigate the achievable rate of the considered system that exploits the SWIP for IoT NOMA based diamond relay network, in which one source or base decision transmits two symbols to the destination node via the help of two energy harvesting based relay node adopting power splitting architecture. Then we derive the analytical expression for the achievable rate of the symbols and achievable rate for the considered system model and validate it through the simulation result. Moreover, asymptotic closed form solution for the achievable rate is also provided for mathematical tractability and simplified analysis. For a fair and logical comparison of the considered NOMA SWIFT system, we devise the model using orthogonal multiple access SWIFT and compare them. Our result demonstrate the effect of uh, different energy harvesting parameters, NOMA power allocation coefficient, relay distance and effectiveness of the considered system over the similar system model using conventional OMA SWIFT scheme. Related works. NOMA based uh, diamond relaying network, which was first proposed in reference 24. It provides an effective strategy to improve the achievable rate of the system compared to a traditional two-way uh, cooperative communication protocol. A protocol for NDR network is investigated and the joint power allocation problem is examined in reference seven. Moreover, a full duplex NDR network is proposed in reference 22. 
Here, the author studied the ergodic sum capacity performance of the system under imperfect signal to interference cancellation technique. Now, the research gap. All of these works did not examine the impact of SWIFT on the NDR network. Moreover, there is not much work investigated on the NDR network. The reason for combining NDR network with SWIFT is obvious since NDR is an effective strategy to improve the system achievable rate. Further, integrating NDR network with SWIFT will further provide incentives to the relay node to take an active part in relaying, thereby enhancing the energy efficiency of the system. Note that such a network topology uh, considered in this paper has been established as a standard cooperative relaying model in the third generation partnership pro project. Now consider system model scenario. So in the, in the left hand side, we can see the consider system model scenario of this paper. So here we can see a, a source node and the destination node. Here uh, the relay node R1 and R2 are placed in such a way that uh, R1 node is placed close to the source node and R2 node is placed close to the destination node. So here the system setup is uh, uh, designed as a diamond shape. Now here the source node transmit two symbol X1 and X2 to the destination node via uh, the energy harvesting uh, relays uh, R1 and R2. Here we have assumed that there is no direct connection between the source node and the destination node. So the transmission of uh, data is only possible through this uh, re uh, relay node R1 and R2. So since we have considered the relay node our energy harvesting based relay node, so we have adopted power splitting architecture uh, at the relay node. So in the right hand side figure, we can, we can see that in PS architecture, uh, epsilon uh, PS is uh, required for uh, energy harvesting and one minus epsilon PS is required for information processing at the relay nodes. So here uh, the system, our system model working is uh, divided into two phase, first phase and the second phase. In the first phase, the source transmits the superimposed data symbol, uh, square root of A1 PS X1 plus square root of A2 PS X2 to both relays R1 and R2 using the concept of downlink NOMA protocol where A1 is less than A2 and A1 plus A2 equals to one. Here the energy harvested uh, at R1 is given by equation one and the transmit power of the relay node R1 is given by equation two. Similarly, the energy harvested at R2 is given by equation three and the transmit power of R2 is given by Equation four. Now, the receive SINR at uh, S2 R1 link in this phase is given by equation five and six. Similarly, the receive SINR at S2 R2 link is given by equation seven. In the second phase, at the destination node D, the receive signal from R2 to D link is stronger than the signal received from R1 to D link. Therefore, X2 is uh, decoded first at D. The receive SINR for X2 at D is given by equation eight. Similarly, the receive SINR for X1 at D is given by equation nine. Now, the achievable data rate of uh, X1 symbol. According to our system model, the achievable data rate associated with symbol X1 is given by equation 10, where E denotes the statistical expectation operator. Now, we have given some theorems for the achievable uh, data rate of X1 and X2 in our paper. So in theorem one, the analytical expression for achievable rate associated with X1 symbol is given by equation 11 where G is miser G function with parameters 0, 0, 0, 1 and psi is di gamma function. Now, asymptotics of X1. So at high SNR, the asymptotic closed form solution for the achievable rate uh, of X1 symbol is given by equation 12. Similarly, at high SNR for, and for large value of AV value in equation 11, a simpler asymptotic closed form for the achievable rate of X1 symbol 
as in equation 11 is given as equation 13 where uh, gamma hat is Euler constant. The detailed proof is given in our paper. Now achievable data rate of X2 uh, is given by equation 14. Now the analytical expression for the achievable rate associated with symbol X2 is given by equation 15, where E1 is exponential integral of order one. And the detailed proof is also given in our paper. Asymptotic of X2 at high SNR, the asymptotic closed form solution for the achievable rate of X2 symbol is given by equation 16, where Li2z is a poly logarithmic function. Similarly, at high SNR, the first order asymptotic closed form solution for the achievable rate of X2 symbol is given by equation 17. Now, achievable data rate of OMA swift diamond relaying system. So, to, in order to compare our consider system model with the OMA swift diamond relaying system, we have uh, devised the system uh, using uh, time division multiple access and OMA scheme. So, here the achievable data rate of the OMA swift diamond relaying system is given by equation 20, where uh, where uh, rho equals to PS by N0 is the transmit SNR and E denotes the statistical expectation operator. Now, these are the simulation parameters that we have considered uh, for the uh, results in our paper. Now, in figure two and three, we plot the achievable rate of X1 and X2 symbol against the uh, transmit SNR. We see that the achievable rate for both X1 and X2 is an increasing function with respect to transmit SNR. Also, we observe that the achievable rate of X1 is higher than the achievable rate of X2 for transmit SNR greater than 10 dB. The reason is the R1 node is closer to source node than R2. Therefore, uh, the X1 symbol gets the SIC gain during the downlink NOMA phase. Also, R1 uses the full harvested power for transmission of X1, and X1 also uh, gets advantage of interference fee transmission during the uplink NOMA phase, as uh, shown in second phase. Also, as we increase the power switching factor from 0 0.3 to 0 0.7, the achievable rate for X1 increases. However, it is not the case with uh, X2. For X2, increasing the power switching factor decreases the achievable rate. The difference is visible at low uh, transmit SNR. As uh, transmit SNR increases, the achievable rate for X2 at uh, power switching factor 0 0.3 is almost comparable with uh, the power switching factor 0 0.7. This indicates that a lower power switching factor favors the achievable rate of X2 and a higher uh, power setting factor is required to have a higher achievable rate for X1. Moreover, we see a close match for analytical and simulation results for both X1 and X2 symbol, which indicates that our derived analytical expression are intact. Moreover, we also see a close agreement for the asymptotic, which uh, demonstrate that one can use the simplified analysis to analytical expression at high SNR uh, to get the result. In figure four, we plot the achievable rate of the considered system and compare it with the OMA sweep diamond relaying system. We see, we see that our proposed scheme uh, achievable rate uh, performance is uh, significantly higher than the OMA sweep scheme at uh, all power splitting factor from 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. In figure five, we plot the achievable data rate of the system against the power sitting factor at different uh, transmit SNR, uh, such as 10, 25, and, and 40 dB. We observe that the achievable rate of the system first uh, increases, reaches up to the maximum, then it start decreases, which indicates that the achievable rate is a concave function that have a unique maxima on the interval of zero to one which can be easily found out through the uh, iterative approaches such as golden sector search method. So now in figure six, we found out the optimal power listing factor 
at uh, different energy harvesting factor 0.9 and 0.6 we uh, this uh, optimal power system factor can be utilized uh, uh, before the data transmission to have optimal achievable rate performance of the system also we observe that um, the the lower uh, energy harvesting efficiency tends to increase the optimal power shifting factors uh, to uh, to harvest more energy to have a higher uh, achievable rate of the system also uh, in figure 7 uh, we plot the achievable rate of the x2 versus an um, noma power allocation coefficient a2 here uh, why we have considered achievable rate uh, of x2 symbol uh, because uh, as you can see uh, that uh, achievable rate uh, x2 is uh, more affected as compared to x1 symbol so here we observe that as we increase the power allocation coefficient factor from 0.1 to 0.8 and uh, uh, the achievable rate performance of x2 tends to increase and also as we increase this uh, transmit snr from 10 db to uh, 40 db the achievable rate of x2 also increases so which indicates that with the proper selection of this a2 parameter and and uh, transmit snr we can expect a higher achievable rate performance of x2 now in figure in figure 8 we we plot uh, we check the achievable rate performance of x2 against the noma power allocation coefficient a1 which has been assigned uh, for the x1 symbol uh, as expected the achievable rate performance of x2 increases with an increase in a1 at lower uh, transmit snr such as 10 db the achievable rate performance is almost saturated with an increase in a2 however when p is uh, higher when transmit snr is higher such as 25 and 40 db uh, increasing the power allocation uh, for the x1 symbol has a uh, greater effect on the achievable rate performance of x2 therefore with a proper selection of the noma power allocation a uh, coefficient factor and transmit snr one can increase the achievable uh, rate performance of x2 now in figure 9 uh, we plot the achievable rate of x1 and x2 versus the relays uh, placement since the relay node r1 and r2 are energy harvesting node and they are helping the source node to transmit x1 and x2 symbol to the destination node their placement from the source node also have a great impact on the achievable rate performance of x1 and x2 so here we observe that as the distance between r1 and the source node increases the achievable rate of both x1 and x2 decreases at rho equals to 10 db it is also interesting to note that as we increase the dr1 distance uh, and at lower transmit snr such as 10 db the achievable rate of x2 actually exceeds the achievable rate performance of x1 however when the transmit snr is higher that is 30 db and more the achievable rate of x2 actually increases with an increase in dr1 distance and it becomes almost saturated this indicates that increasing the dr1 distance uh, have more impact on the achievable rate performance of x1 than that of x2 therefore the r1 nodes uh, should be placed close to the source node to have optimal performance on the achievable rate of the system conclusion and future work so in this paper we exploited uh, swift for iot noma based diamond relay network which is an effective strategy to improve the achievable performance of the system we successfully investigated the achievable rate performance of the considered system analytical expression for the achievable rate of symbols and achievable rate of the considered system were derived and verified with the simulation result moreover asymptotic closed form solutions were for, were provided for mathematical tractability and simplified analysis 
Since we exploited Swift for consider system, we also found out the optimal power distributing factor that can achieve optimum performance for the achievable rate of the consider system. Finally, our result also demonstrated that the R1 node should be placed close to the source uh, to have a higher achievable performance of the system. For future work, we would like to investigate the outage performance of the proposed system with a nonlinear energy harvesting model, studying and investigating the secrecy capacity in the presence of EVS driver is also interesting for future work. Thank you. If you have any question, you can email me at asisar at the rate ife.uio.no. Hello, my name is Amani Abu Safiya from the Sensory Cloud Services Lab at University of Sydney. Today I'm going to present our work, Reliability Model for Incentive-Driven IoT Energy Services. So I will start by covering the background, then I'll discuss the motivating scenario, then I will state the problem that we are addressing, and then I will present our proposed approach after that, I will discuss the experiments and then I'll conclude. So to start, Internet of Things or IoT devices are everyday objects that are connected to the Internet. And they are usually equipped with sensors and actuators. According to studies, it is expected to have around 75 billion IoT devices in use by 2025. So, the ubiquity of IoT devices allowed the development of many crowd-sourced applications. Examples of crowd-sourced IoT applications are smart cities, energy, and the environment. The abstraction of IoT devices may provide novel IoT services. Example of IoT services is Wi-Fi hotspot sharing services and energy services. So what is energy as a service? Energy services is the wireless transfer of energy among IoT devices. The energy may be harvested from natural resources such as body heat or it might be just a spare energy in the IoT device itself. The energy may be transferred using the new developed technology named as over-the-air charging. So an example of this technology is Energis. Energis allows the transfer of energy up to 4.5 meters. Energy services have several benefits including that it offers a green solution. Since IoT is one of the main contributors to 8% of the global carbon footprint caused by information and communication technologies, using energy services allows us to utilize the spare energy and therefore offer a more eco-friendly solution. Another benefit is the convenience of the energy services. So energy, uh, the, the idea of having uh, access to charge your devices anywhere and anytime all makes this solution a convenient solution. So to set the scene, let's assume that we have a smart building divided into microcells. Each microcell is a confined area where people gather such as restaurants and coffee shops. The microcell consists of IoT-based energy service providers and consumers. So providers submit their advertisement and consumers submit the request to the IoT coordinator at the edge. To increase participation, providers get reward from the system if they share their energy. However, sometimes due to several reasons, the energy transfer may be disrupted by the consumer's movement. The problem when the, if the consumer leaves the area is that it's going to impact the provider's reward, which will discourage the provider and therefore decrease the participation in energy sharing. So the challenge is that uh, may leave. 
which again going to impact the provider's reward and decrease the participation in energy sharing. So the problem that we are trying to address is designing a reliability model that uses the consumer's previous history to assess their reliability. And we also want to compose the most reliable requests to ensure the maximum reward and therefore to increase the utilization of spare energy. Our proposed framework has two main components. The reliability model, which will be used to evaluate the consumer's reliability and the composition of the services to uh, make sure that we maximize the reward for the provider. So we'll start with the reliability model. The reliability model has uh, the following attributes. The consumption history, energy disruption, which is categorized to voluntary and involuntary, and then the random behavior. So we'll start with the first attribute. So the first attribute is the consumption history. The consumption history uses the number of successful requests to indicate the reliability of the consumer. A successful request is defined as the one that received all the amount of energy that was requested. This is the equation to compute the reliability of the history, where SER refers to the successful requests and the total ER represents the total number of submitted requests. The second attribute in the reliability model is the energy disruption. The movement in and out of the microcells may result in disrupting the energy transfer. The energy disruption may be voluntary or involuntary. So voluntary disruption refers to the conscious decision by the consumer to discontinue the energy transfer. In other words, the disruption happens toward the end of the energy transfer. Computing the voluntary reliability for an energy request is done based on energy and time. As you can see, for example, the energy reliability will be the average of the ratio between the received energy and the requested energy. And the same thing is done for the time attribute. So to compute the voluntary reliability, we just have to sum these two values and divide them by two. As for the other type of energy disruption, it's the involuntary disruption. And involuntary disruption refers to the intermi intermittent disconnection in energy transfer within a single energy request. Computing the involuntary reliability of an energy request includes computing the frequency of disconnections and the duration of these disconnections. That is, an energy request is more reliable when the disconnections are less frequent and for a small time period. So the frequency of disconnection for an energy request is computed based on the uh, following equation. So you can see here that we have, uh, if the frequency is zero, then the reliability is one. If the frequency is one and it's within a given time threshold, or if it's one and it's towards the end of the request, then we consider them as involuntary disconnection we give them the value is 0.7. If the user has too many frequent disconnections, then we divide one over that frequency. So the frequency reliability of a consumer is computed as the average of the reliability of the frequency of all the requests. As for the duration of this connection, so we compute the duration of disconnection of an energy request as one minus the ratio of the summation of disconnection within the request over the time of that request. Then we compute the reliability based on the duration of disconnection as the average of the reliability of duration of disconnections for all the requests. After that, the involuntary reliability will be computed as the reliability of the frequency and the reliability of the disconnection divided by two. The last attribute that we have is random behavior. 
and random behavior images, the level of fluctuations regarding the consumer's commitment to receive their requested energy. So you can see, for example, this is an example of a very random uh, behavior. So sometimes this consumer commit, sometimes he drop in the middle of the request and sometimes he drops towards the end. We use the variation rate as an indication to measure the random behavior. We compute the uh, variation rate of a consumer behavior based on energy and time. And as you can see here, this is the variation rate for each one of them. Then we compute the random reliability as the sum of both variation rates. Loss after that, the reliability score of a consumer is computed as the summation of all the aforementioned reliability attributes. Then the reliability score of the service composition will be the summation of the selected consumer's reliability scores. Going back to our proposed framework, we discussed the reliability model, which will be used to assess the reliability of every consumer. And now we have to discuss the composition approaches. So for composition, let's say that we have these requests, which we computed the reliability score using the reliability model. How do we compose these requests? So we have two proposed approaches. And the first one is uh, inspired by first come first serve priority based scheduling, which selects the request that gives the highest reliability, which in this case will be ER1 and ER4. As for the second approach, the adaptive reliability based composition, ARB, we in this approach, we downsize the request based on the rel reliability score so we can add more requests. So for example, if this request is 25 reliable, then we will downsize it to 25% so that we can add more other, or we can add other energy requests. Now to discuss uh, the evaluation, we first have to discuss the used data set, which was published by IBM for a coffee shop chain within three branches. The data set consists of transaction records of consumers purchases in each coffee shop for the month of April. We used the records as energy service requests and randomly generated the rest of the energy request attributes. For each energy service, we use a framework to compose the energy requests that are most reliable and maximize the reward of the service provider. The evaluation we evaluated four approaches brute force first come first served as the greedy approach reliability uh, based uh, which is one of our proposed approach and the adaptive reliability reliability base the arb the evaluation was based on four uh, components reliability score rewards energy utilization and execution time So we run the composition algorithms and the other techniques in different settings by changing the time interval length of the services, as you can see in all the x-axis. We repeated the experiments 12,000 times at each point where the duration of energy services increased. The first experiment on the left um, compares the average reliability score. As previously discussed, the reliability score presents the commitment of the consumers to receive the requested energy. Therefore, a high reliability score of a composition ensures a better reward for the provider. We can notice the reliability score increases when the provider staying time increase for all the composition algorithms. This can be explained by the provider staying time to share their energy. The longer the staying time of the provider, the more requests they can fulfill. The proposed algorithm RB performs slightly better than greedy in terms of reliability as it considers the reliability of each energy request. In addition, the brute force approach gives slightly better results than the RB as it looks for all the possible combinations of composition and it selects the composition, composition with the highest reliability score. However, the brute force approach has a higher computation cost compared to the RB as shown on the 
right figure. The proposed algorithm ARB, ARB gives the best result as it downsized the amount of requested energy in each energy request based on their reliability score. Downsizing the request allows the ARB algorithm to include more requests and therefore aggregate additional reliability scores. The same observation and justifications can be used to explain the results of the reward experiment on the left side. As for the right side ex uh, figure, it represents the last experiment which computes the provider's remaining energy. A low remaining energy of a provider's service indicates a good energy utilization, which promotes a green IoT environment. We can notice the remaining energy decreases when the, decreases when the provider's staying time increases for all the composition algorithms. This observation is similar to the previous experiments due to the provider's staying time. The figure also shows that the proposed approach RB performs better than the greedy approach in terms of utilizing the provider energy service. As previously mentioned, the RB approach composes energy requests while considering the reliability score. Considering the reliability enables the RB approach to ensure the commitment of consumers to receive energy, which results in better energy utilization. The proposed algorithm ARB gives the best results among all approaches. As previously discussed, the ARB algorithm downsizes each energy request based on its reliability score. So, to conclude, we propose a reliability-based and incentive-driven energy service request composition framework. A new reliability model is designed to capture the consumer's consumption pattern. We also proposed an adaptive reliability-based approach that adjusts requests and rewards to the reliability score of the consumer. The experimental results show that both proposed composition approaches, RB and ARB, outperform the greedy approach in maximizing the reliability and rewards. ARB also outperformed the brute force approach in reliability, rewards, and execution time. The future direction might be to improve the framework to accommodate different incentive preferences. Thank you so much and let me know if you have any questions. Hello everyone, my name is Belsa Melkouz and I'll be presenting our paper on formation-based selection of drone swarm services. The outline of my presentation, I'm going to start with an introduction and then describe the swarm-based drone as a service selection model and then the selection framework, the experimental results and finally the conclusion. As we all know, Drones are one of the important IoT devices whose power is leveraged while developing and operating a smart city. Drones are aircrafts that can be navigated without a human pilot on board. There is an increasing need to use drone swarms in a large number of applications. Drone swarms are a set of drones that act as a single entity to achieve a common goal. Drone swarms are used in military, sky shows, airborne communication networks, and delivery. This work focuses on using drone swarms for delivery purposes. There are several aspects that a drone swarm should consider to deliver its potential. This includes collaboration, communication, and formation. Drone swarm formation is key to achieving a safe and efficient flight. This work focuses on swarm formations. Different flight formations are studied in biology and military. In military, for instance, different formations allow for a better view and more protection for individual planes. In biology, studies focus on the many species of birds that travel together in different formations. The different formations are found to be taken for different purposes. For example, a V formation of geese help the birds to use less energy as they fly. 
This is because of their positioning in the swarm that lifts them up using the upwash forces generated by the front birds. Talking about drone deliveries. Companies including Amazon, Google, and Uber started advanced trials in drone delivery. Drone delivery is characterized by its fast speed and low cost. The use of drone swarms in delivery adds to these benefits. For example, a single drone has payload limitations, which can be overcome by the use of multiple drones. The drones in a swarm could also be made to deliver farther destinations. In this case, the payload that a single drone could carry may be divided among multiple drones to reduce the strains on the rotors, which directly affects the power consumption. This end result will increase the flight range for the swarm. We use the service paradigm as a way to model the delivery of services. We adopt a model for swarm-based drone as a service where the authors abstract a swarm traveling in a, line in a line segment in a skyway network as a service. The function of a drone swarm delivery is to deliver multiple packages from a source to a destination. The non-functional or quality of service aspects of swarm delivery include the delivery time, power consumption, and cost. Given a Skyway network, our aim is to select the best Skyway segments for delivery. The best set is the, th is the set that optimizes the quality of service properties. In this paper, we focus on optimizing the energy consumption. Different from ground transportation, such as trucks, drones are largely affected by wind. In addition, they are highly constrained by their battery capacities. In this work, we explore the effect of different flight formations of drone swarms on the energy consumption. We study the effect of the overall swarm energy consumption and on the individual drones. Our goal is to select the best skyway segments through flight formations. The formation of the swarm will guide the selection process. Let us assume a hospital uses drone delivery services to get medical equipment delivered on a regular basis. These pieces of equipment must be delivered together at the same time. In this case, a swarm of drones would be needed to deliver multiple packages to the hospital by a certain deadline. In this context, a swarm of drones would use a skyway network whose vertices would consist of building rooftops with charging stations. The main challenge is to determine the best Skyway path to deliver all the packages within the expected delivery time. In addition, extrinsic constraints would have to be addressed during medical supplies delivery. These constraints include the limited number of charging stations at intermediate nodes, the drones need to recharge due to their limited flight ranges. Another extrinsic constraint is the existing of environmental uncertainties such as wind. Therefore, we reformulate the problem of delivery as finding the best service path in the skyway given these constraints. We investigate the effect of different drone formations in a swarm under different wind conditions. Drone's energy consumption is affected heavily by the wind conditions. The swarm need to minimize the energy consumption to reduce the number of stops for battery recharges. This in return will reduce the overall delivery time by reducing the charging and waiting times caused by sequential recharges at each node. Going on to the swarm based drone as a service selection model. Service selection is the process of identifying services from all available services that match the functional and non-functional requirements of a consumer. Service selection is usually a a step done before service composition to filter out services that are not optimal for the composition purposes. The selected services are the set of services where all the drones in the swarm can travel successfully in a skyway segment without running out of battery power during the travel. In the service composition step, the best set of services from the selected services are composed from the source to the destination. The focus of this work is the selection of services. The composition will be the extension of this work. In this paper, we identify two types of swarms based on the formation decision, preset swarms and flexible swarms. 
A preset swarm is a swarm whose formation is determined before the selection and composition process. The decision of the formation is made before the travel is initiated and continues throughout the trip without changing. Computations regarding the wind effect on the power consumption are based on the pre-decided swarm formation. The selection eliminates services in which the drone's battery consumption is not sufficient to continue the travel safely. The selection process in this type is straightforward and does not require heavy computations during the service selection process. However, it would come with the cost of higher energy consumption. This is because the formation selection is based on the average wind conditions and not the specific conditions in every Skyway segment. On the other hand, a flexible swarm is a swarm whose formation decisions are made throughout the trip. For every Skyway segment, the swarm decides the best formation to take based on the wind condition of the segment. Hence, the swarm does not travel from the source to the destination in one formation. The formation changes as the wind condition changes. As mentioned earlier, for every wind condition, there is an optimal flight formation that reduces the overall energy consumption of a swarm. Computations regarding the wind effect on the power consumption will be different at each segment based on the decided formations. Services in which the drone's battery consumption is not sufficient to continue the travel safely are discarded. This type of swarm overcomes the problem of higher energy consumption due to average conditions. Going into the selection framework, first we introduce the different forces affecting a swarm through different formations. We specifically study the upwash and downwash forces and the drag forces on a swarm. We use ANSYS Discovery Live to simulate the different formations under different conditions. We vary the conditions of wind using speed and direction. ANSYS Discovery Live allows us to compute the drag forces on all the faces of the drawn model. These drag values are later used to compute the power consumption. In this work, we focus on modeling the energy consumption of different flight formations using quadcopters. A quadcopter is the most popular design for small drones. A quadcopter is a multi-rotor helicopter lifted and propelled by four rotors. We use the Beaufort wind scale to categorize the wind speeds. The scale re relates wind speed to observed conditions at sea or on land. The table shows the different wind speeds using Beaufort scale. We only consider Beaufort numbers 0 to 6 as the most commercial quadcopters are safe to fly under 13.8 meters per second wind speed. We also consider three directions respective to this form, including front, right, and lift. Starting with the first type of forces, the downwash and upwash forces. The study of training forces generated by wings have been largely studied in the birds and fixed wing planes. In a similar manner to birds, a quadcopter flying forward while maintaining its altitude also produces the same effect. As the quadcopter flies forward, the front pro propellers rotate slower than the back propellers. This allows the drone to pitch forward. This variance in propellers rotating speeds along with the orientation produces upwash and downwash trailing forces as shown in the figure. We use ANSYS Discovery Live to prove that these forces occur in real scenarios. We use a DJI Phantom 3 model and create rotating walls on the propellers to study the behavior. We set the front propellers to rotate at a speed of 10 revolutions per second and the back propellers at the speed of 15.3 revolutions per second. We then test the lift forces on another drone. First, we test when the drones are aligned in front of each other directly. Second, we test when the back drone is sliding a bit to the side of the front drone. The results, as shown in the figure, show that a quadcopter in these settings acts similar to the birds. The drone slightly to the side experienced a lift force in the positive direction or the upwash force, whereas the drone directly at the back experienced a downward force in the negative direction, downwash. This behavior raises the need to fly the drone's informations. There are different popular flight formations taken by planes in military and by migrating birds. We study five formations. The formations are column, front, echelon, V, and diamond. We assume a swarm is made up of five quadcopters. 
We test how the formations affect the aerodynamic drag forces on the surfaces of the quadcopter under different wind conditions. We then test the drag forces on individual drones in the swarm and the overall average drag on the swarm. We then compute the energy consumption of each formation and decide which formation is best under which wind condition. There are two types of selections we propose in this work, fixed and adaptive swarm-based drone as a service selection. We create two algorithms for each selection type. We assume that all the drones in the swarm carry the same payload. We also assume that the drones fly in a relatively similar altitude throughout the journey. Hence, the effect of varying air pressure is minimal and is not considered in this work. We focus on studying the effect of formations on the surface selection. In a fixed selection, all wind conditions of all the services connecting the source and the destination nodes are averaged. We take the average wind speed value between all skyway segments and the most common wind direction. We use this averaged value to choose the best fixed formation that will traverse the network without changing. Then we check all the services and compute the energy consumption of all the drones in the swarm. The energy consumption consists of the energy consumed due to the flight range, the drag, and the upwash and downwash forces. If all the drones had successful flights, or energy consumption is less than 100% of the battery power, then we return successful services as the selected services. In an adaptive selection, the formation of the swarm can change at every skyway segment. In this type of selection, we look at every skyway segment and choose the best formation accordingly. The best formation is the formation that reduces the energy consumption due to the wind drag force and upwash and downwash forces. And then again, we compute the energy consumption for all the drones. And the energy consumption is due to the flight range, the drag and the upwash and downwash forces. If all the drones had successful flights when they reached the next node, then we return the successful services as the selected services. Next are the experiments and the results. Assuming that the swarm composes of a set of five identical drones, in the first experiment, we run ANSYS software to test the drag forces on every individual drone in the swarm. We used a DJI Phantom 3 model to run our tests, we then compute the average energy consumption of the full swarm. We fix the wind speed to test the drag from different wind directions. We also assume that the drones are flying at a speed of 15.6 meters per second. This table summarizes the results of the first experiment. We can notice that the best formation that reduces the drag forces when the wind comes from the front is the column formation. On the other hand, the front formation performed best when the wind is coming from the right or left. Note that we do not consider the upwash or downwash forces in this experiment. If we look at the drag forces of individual drones, we can get insights on which drones face most drag due to wind. For example, in a diamond formation, the drag forces on drones 3 and 5 are significantly lower than the others in the front wind. This can be important in applications where the most valuable delivery items are carried by these specific drones that fly in the formation to be protected from the wind. In the second experiment, we evaluate the combined effects of drag forces with the upwash and downwash forces. We can see from the table that the formations that consume the least amount of energy is the fee formation for the front wind and the diamond formation for the right and left winds. Although the column and front formations performed better when only the drag forces are computed in the previous experiments, the V and diamond outperformed them due to the upwash and downwash forces from the drone swarm position. In the third experiment, we evaluate the effect of varying different wind speeds according to Buford scale. The results of this experiment on the V formation are shown in the figure. As shown, Buford scale 0 and 1 have minimal effect on the drag values 
and as the scale increases, the drag value approximately doubles at each scale number. Similar behavior is seen for different formations. Now we evaluate our selection algorithms. The dataset used in these experiments is an urban road network dataset from the City of London with nodes representing intersections and edge length representing the distance between the nodes. For the experiments, we took a subnetwork of connected nodes with size 2732 to mimic a possible arrangement of a Skyway network. We then synthesized different wind speeds and wind directions for every segment. We assume that the drone model is the DJI Phantom 3 flying at a speed of 15.6 meters per second. The rest of the variables are used to compute the energy consumption. In the first experiment, we evaluate the energy consumption of both selection algorithms, the fixed and the adaptive. We group the output of the algorithms, or the selected services, based on their distances. The x-axis in the figure represents the distances, and the y-axis represents the energy consumption due to the different forces and flight range. As shown in the graph, the proposed adaptive algorithm outperforms the fixed algorithm significantly. The adaptive algorithm saves more energy since the optimal formation that saves the most energy is selected at each Skyway segment. In the second experiment, we repeat the first experiment, but we group the services based on the wind speeds rather than the distance. This will allow us to see the performance of both algorithms under different wind conditions. As shown in the figure, the adaptive algorithm outperforms the fixed algorithm in terms of energy consumption. This is because the drones in the fixed algorithm select the formation based on average wind conditions, which may not be the optimal solution in different skyway segments. Although the ad adaptive algorithm outperformed the fixed algorithm, it comes with the cost of execution time. This is shown in the figure, where the x-axis represents the number of nodes of different subnetworks of our network, as the network size increases, the adaptive algorithm takes more execution time compared to the fixed algorithm. We conclude that depending on the application, the choice of algorithm implementation would be different. For example, in the case of an emergency where we need to ensure a fast delivery with the least number of stops for recharging, more resources may be utilized for the computation. The computations are usually done on edge nodes. On the other hand, if the delivery time is flexible but the number of resources for computation is limited, then the fixed algorithm would be the better choice. To conclude, we proposed a swarm-based drone as a service selection model for delivery services. We identified two types of selections, fixed and adaptive, and two algorithms were proposed that take extrinsic constraints into consideration. We studied the effect of swarm formations under different wind conditions. We then studied the drag forces and the upwash and downwash forces. And we saw that the adaptive uh, algorithm outperformed the fixed algorithm in energy consumption. In the future, we would like to extend this work to compose the full path from the source to the destination. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, so I'll be presenting our work uh, about the elastic composition of crowdsourced energy services in the IoT environment. So this work is uh, has been conducted in the SES lab, Sensor Cloud Services lab, uh, a new lab recently established at the University of Sydney in the Computer Science School. We are working on uh, different uh, aspects, cloud services, the IoT and crowdsourcing. The current work is uh, makes part of what we are doing um, uh, in crowdsourcing and IoT. To motivate this uh, work, it's very easy because it's um, it targets a very common problem nowadays. I believe all of us are aware of and some of us uh, already faced in their daily routine simply is low battery or dead battery for my smartphone or smartwatch. I'm outside 
my battery is low, has a low battery, and I'm looking for any source to charge it to run some urgent call or any to use my device for anything. So this problem is being emphasized more and more with the rise of IoT and the wearables. So in the all of us we have smartphones obviously and in the near future most of us will have these gadgets like smartwatch and band wrist and maybe more than that we will have these smart garments like smart shirts and smart shoes so if we look at the wearables they have these augmented capabilities so they have computing power storage and sensing and on top of that some IoT devices and wearables they have the ability to do more than that which harvest energy to solve this problem that we just talked about so if we we can imagine a smart shirt with this special textile that can transform the sunbeams into energy or the body heat into energy or smart shoes which is a more obvious example for that the smart shoes which transforms the footsteps into energy as well to charge itself and the smartphone of its wear for example so if we look at that we can consider this harvested energy or um, even we talked about the problem of I have a low battery but it's not the case all the time some people drain their batteries but others not we can for some people their, their phones are most of the time idle they use it just for the basic functionality so they have this spare energy so there is this large spectrum some people they drain their batteries and some people their batteries are idle most of the time and there is this spectrum so we have this spare energy uh, in, in the IoT devices in addition to the harvested energy from the uh, smart garments so it looks not much but if we consider the crowd and multiple people are providing this or their spare energy this could provide something useful so this uh, energy if we have the wireless charging we use the wireless charging to get all of this energy we can provide an energy source to that poor guy who are looking desperately to charge their smartphone for to, to run an urgent phone call for them so our goal is to recycle the energy and crowdsource it from multiple IoT devices knowing that people usually flock in different places in a smart city and gather so we can define this energy service based on the crowd behavior and energy recycling and the wireless charging so an energy service simply is uh, the wireless delivery of energy from a device to another within a predefined time frame so the prospective environment as i said people gather in confined areas like workplaces the university schools movie theater coffee shops malls museums so we call these as micro cells in the micro cell we can find people providing energy from their IoT devices and people who are in a need for energy so yeah and this uh, these providers can provide energy to these consumers so to to run that we have the IoT coordinator at the level of uh, the edge which simply can be a router in a coffee shop so this is the prospected environment for our uh, work So the challenge is we do have the energy services we look like that we solve the problem of this uh, to provide an energy source outdoor indoor to that desperate guy looking to charge their their phones however there is 
uh, multiple challenges to deploy this, these energy services. The first thing is we know, we already know that the IoT devices have limited resources. So even the limited capacity to store energy. The second challenge is that these IoT devices are providing energy from a source that they are already using. So it's a spare energy. So it's not always guaranteed, especially with the fact that in crowdsourcing, we don't have any SLA or any contract between the provider and the consumer. So it's just an altruistic way to provide services. So it might, the spare energy might be provided as a service, then it might be used by the same user and this service is not guaranteed. And another challenge is, as I mentioned, there's no SLA in the crowdsourcing and people have different, different preferences. So uh, in, 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 the, in the gathering behavior of the crowd in micro cells, in a coffee shop, for example, I have different preferences. I go to the coffee shop at certain time, other people go at certain time based on their preferences. So we try matching these people based according to their spatial topic preferences and looking for the spare energy to provide it as a service to consumers. Is This is the framework that we are looking for. So we have to address all of these challenges to, uh, in addition to the mobility, uh, actually, which is a very obvious challenge in a smart city and for the crowd because people are moving all the time. So addressing these challenges unlocks the full potential of the solution, the energy solution we, we are uh, promoting here. In this work, we're going to be focusing only on these three, on the, just on the fluctuation limited resource and the crowd preferences, and the mobility is, uh, is being targeted in a, in, in a parallel study. So I'll, I'll explain uh, our work here in um, uh, this example. So imagine that we have a um, bunch of services in a coffee shop providing uh, energy and a consumer is looking for a certain energy amount. So these services, if we take we take energy from these services and compose it, combine it together, we might provide uh, energy for this consumer at the time frame that uh, he or she uh, advertised. So we have two situations here. The the brown. Uh, line represents the uh, uh, composition one and the blue represents the composition two, number two. So for the first composition, we might not get all what, um, we might get only 60% of what the uh, provider asked for, that the consumer asked for, with, but with a higher liability, 90%, and with a very short extension after the initial time frame advertised by the consumer, only 10 minutes. However, in the second uh, composition, the blue one, we might get more than the initial in the first composition, which is 75% of the required requested energy, but with a very low reliability. And the required time extension to get uh, what the consumer asked for is 25 minutes because uh, we look for the remaining 25% and we estimate that we might wait longer to get more energy because there is a high chance that two contributing services for this composition might drop due to the fluctuation, for example, the challenge that we, we uh, talked about before. So we rely on the consumer's flexibility. They might wait a little bit longer to get more reliable uh, energy services. And we consider the reliability of a service ahead of time to, to avoid any failure or any long time extension for consumers. 
Our contribution is a framework which has a service model that presents services, services and flexible requests which can be elastic, that it has an initial time frame and it can be extended a bit to get more reliable and more energy uh, for, for, for that uh, consumer. And uh, the framework so it relies on this flexible service model and an elastic composition framework which considers the reliability of a service, estimates the reliability of services and based on the reliability it provides the requested energy and with a high reliability. So we transform this composition into a multi-objective optimization where we are considering the reliability and the requested energy and the minimum time extension for uh, the flexible consumers. So the first step in our framework is to compose to compose the energy services to serve the request, the energy request at the initial time frame, which we refer to by the soft deadline here. Um, so simply we chunk the request uh, based on the available services. We consider the beginning. Uh, so we use the, the proposed spatial topological knapsack based spatial topological composition algorithm proposed in our um, previous work. We can we chunk the request based on the available services. We take the start time or the end time of any available service within the time frame of the request and chunk the request and take as much energy as possible within that time frame. So then we get what we get from within this time frame then if it's not all what the um, consumer asked for we might extend and look for an ex extra energy amount after that soft deadline however not after the hard deadline defined by the consumer as well so we have this composition which has a candidate composite service that is represented by the obtained energy within the soft deadline and the obtained in addition to the obtained energy obtained after the soft deadline uh, which we refer to by the extension so we might have multiple candidate composite services but what we are looking for here as i mentioned earlier uh, and elastic composition that provides a commonly requested energy amount with from reliable services with the minimum time extension so we transformed our problem into multi objective optimization that maximizes the energy and maximizes the reliability and minimizes the time extension so to solve that we have a heuristic uh, algorithm that relies on reducing the space of the candidate composite services uh, based on modified knapsack uh, spatial temporal composition uh, then we have this skyline optimization after getting this uh, reduced space of the candidate composite services we apply the skyline of two-dimensional skyline based on the reliability and the energy then we have this risk uh, strategies risk strategies of the consumers uh, to select the uh, which uh, optimal composition they go with to wrap up, we have the spatial temporal composition algorithm that defines uh, the composition within the, the initial time frame. Then we, have, we prepare the candidate composite services, uh, the spatial temporal composition with the time extension. So we estimate the reliability of each possible composition. We estimate the required time extension for each possible composition as well before the hard deadline we consider only the extensions that end before the hard deadline then we have this multi-objective optimization that 
aims for maximizing the energy, maximizing the reliability, and minimizing the time extension. We solve that using a space reduction, then two-dimensional skyline uh, optimization, then reflecting the preferences of the consumers by this risk-aware selection. In order to uh, assess the performance of our framework, we tried to design a scenario close to reality where people gather in confined areas and provide energy, provide and consume energy from their wearables. So we used multiple data sets to, for, for this purpose. So we used the Yelp data set and used the check-in and check-out data to define the length of a service, energy service or energy request. We used the uh, another data set for renewable energy, solar based renewable energy and smart grid. We have providers and consumers in this data set. So we scale down the um, exchanged energy transactions between the, in the within this smart grid and normalize it uh, into wearable based shareable energy and uh, for the reliability we use the uniform distribution to randomly initially assign reliability scores for for providers and measure their based on their behavior we use the entropy to um, estimate their reliability and the assumption here was that the, the, the regular the behavior, the more regular the, behavior, the user's behavior of the device, the more reliable the service is from this provider. For the soft deadline, the hard deadline, we used Monte Carlo distribution. So this for these three data sets, in addition to the random uh, uniform randomizer, will uh, create this uh, scenario close to reality for sharing energy. The statistics for our data set is uh, mentioned in, in the table below. So we have around 5,000 energy queries in 8,000 confined areas. We vary the number of services from 5,000 to 50,000. And we vary the duration of services, short services, long services, and the same for queries, short queries, and long queries. The first assessment is uh, based on the quality of the solutions obtained by the heuristic and the brute force based multi object objective optimization. So, as we see, the heuristic has a smaller size of the optimal uh, set of uh, comp candidate composite services and the same for the uh, quality of the solutions for the brute force if we average the time extension the estimated time extension for the solutions obtained by the brute force and the heuristic are almost the same if we change the reliability the weight of the reliability and for the effectiveness, we run that based on the preferences of the consumers. So we have risk uh, takers and risk adverse and risk neutral consumers. So for risk adverse people, so people consider the reliability uh, given higher weight to the reliability. So the estimation of our elastic composition for the time extension was accurate and the error was minimal. However, for risk takers, if the failures goes go high, so our estimation is uh, cannot be uh, can have, has a high error because of the number of failures. However, if uh, for a risk neutral and we have we give similar weights for reliability and energy, so our estimation uh, the error estimation is not uh, does not perform well and the time extension the more failures the more uh, time extension is uh, expected and so the behavior is pretty much similar to an algorithm which does not consider failure at all 
and uh, at the end we evaluate the runtime efficiency of our uh, heuristic and brute force for the brute force the solution space exploration is very time consuming that's why in for short service and long service and all kinds of services brute force has the highest runtime runtime however for the heuristic has a significant improvement in the runtime efficiency uh, but it's still higher than the uh, greedy and approach and the temporal knapsack which does not consider reliability at all um, yeah that's all thank you Hi, I'm Srinivas Devarakonda, Srini for short. It's my pleasure to be presenting my work to you all today. I'm a PhD student from Rutgers University in New Jersey, in the United States. My research work is at the confluence of deep learning models and spatiotemporal data in the realm of pollution monitoring. And the end goal is in providing fine-grained pollution measurements for all to consume. I work with Professor Badrinath in the Computer Science uh, Department at Rutgers University. He is my research advisor too. Today, I'm going to talk about how we can infer outside carbon monoxide concentrations based on carbon monoxide measurements inside vehicles. In this work, I collaborated with my colleagues Dehan and Sendhil. By way of introducing our work, let us visit a few scenarios. For example, if you want to know what the temperature is, you measure it. Or you measure your body temperature if you want to know if you have a fever, as there is a direct correlation already established between having a fever and high temperature. But there are a number of situations that are not conducive to this approach. There is no direct correlation between cause and effect. For instance, if you want to find out when a rotating machine is going to fail, you measure the vibrations to infer when it is going to fail. You collect the data, build and train a model to predict the failure based on vibration measurements. Another recent example from MIT is, in order to verify if one has COVID uh, when you are asymptomatic. If you are coughing, you can use the MIT model to discover if you have COVID. This model is quite significant in our current times. In both these cases, it would be a disadvantage if we did not have a prediction model that can take a proxy measurement to infer a measurement of the real entity. In the case of the pump, we cannot wait for its failure to replace it. In the latter case, you run the risk of infecting others when you do not realize that you are infected with COVID. We are relying on proxy measurements to infer the desired outcome in both, both these instances. Our problem is similar. We want to provide fine-grained pollution measurement. Direct measurement is feasible, but it is proving to be expensive. So, so many direct measurement methodologies have been published, including ours, where we deploy our measurement platform on public transportation infrastructure, but the systems are difficult to operate and maintain in the long run. We need to complement direct measurements with alternate means. Many inexpensive dosimeters have been introduced in the market that help you measure your personal space. We proposed that such dosimeters are utilized in a crowdsourced measurement paradigm and while the user is measuring his personal space for exposure during their commutes, we use these measurements inside the vehicle to infer the outside pollution measurement. Good citizens measuring their personal space during their commute could contribute to our cause. We propose to use these crowdsourced measurements and derive the outside measurements and contribute to the fine-grained pollution inventory outside. This is our goal. So here is the approach we have taken to achieve this goal. We need to collect pollution data inside and outside the vehicle. 
These personal dosimeters used to measure personal spaces usually work in tandem with a smartphone. At least the one we used worked that way. So we needed to develop a mobile application to interface with this common off-the-shelf pollution measuring device inside the vehicle and collect the measurements. We built a sensor platform that helps measure the pollution concentrations outside the vehicle. Such devices are not readily available. We needed to build it. However, sensors are available, connectivity is available for us to build a platform to collect outside measurements as we collect measurements inside the car. But these sensor measurements are affected by weather. The sensors themselves do not capture weather information. So we fuse the weather information from other sources. So with the measurements in hand, we architect a suitable neural network model, optimize it, and train for general use. So we evaluate this model against traditional models, and we also evaluate the model to validate if all the design choices we made are good and if the model is robust. So here is uh, an image that uh, shows our measurement uh, methodology. In the image on the left, you see the personal dosimeter. This is called a node device. I provided references uh, to its source uh, in, the, in the paper. Anyone interested can look it up. This is a sensor platform that supports, that supports interchangeable sensors. The white cylinder is the hardware platform and the silver cap on the top is the sensor. We used a carbon monoxide sensor for our uh, 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 model. Node connects to your smartphone and periodically sends the measurements to the phone over Bluetooth. The phone fuses the measurement with the timestamp and GPS information and transmits the data to the cloud server. We calibrated these node sensors at an EPA facility. EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency in the USA. In the image on the right, you see a sensor platform that we assembled using off-the-shelf sensor elements. The sensor platform has a microcontroller that uses a GPS unit for local information. It is also equipped with a cellular modem. The controller periodically collects the pollution measurements, fuses them with the GPS information, that is uh, latitude, longitude, timestamp, and speed, and sends them to the cloud server. On the cloud server, the inside and outside measurements are collated into one record based on timestamp. When I say pollution measurements, I mean CO measurements in the current study. So we use this setup on a couple of vehicles to collect data in the New Jersey and New York area. So the map here shows the extent, the, the spread of the measurement area. We made sure that we covered suburban areas as well as urban areas so that we capture data from a varied terrain. Here, you see data in suburban areas in New Jersey and urban highly populated areas in the Manhattan in New York City. As I mentioned earlier, the sensors are sensitive to weather conditions. They are affected by temperature and humidity. As we are measuring outside, they will also be affected by the wind conditions. As we did not have the sensors to measure these weather parameters, we fulfilled this need as a post-processing step. We reverse geocode the GPS latitude and longitude using Google's reverse geocoding API to get the zip code. Using this zip code and the measurement timestamp, we then use the weather API to collect the meteorological parameters. So using this method, we enrich each data point with temperature, relative humidity, pressure, wind speed, wind direction, and wind gust. We do not know which weather parameters are important in our study. So we collect all that is available using the weather API. We then see which of these parameters is significant for our use in our study in the model. For this, we use principal component analysis, PCA in short. Using PCA, we rank the relevance of each feature and use only those features that are most relevant. The measure of relevance of a feature is its uh, variance. 
So the plot here shows the results of our uh, principal component analysis. The x-axis has the index of each feature. We have 22 features. The features are in the decreasing order of importance as we traverse from the origin and go towards the right along the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the cumulative variance. Results indicate that seven features contribute to about 99.9% variance. So the significant weather parameters based on PCA analysis are temperature, humidity, pressure, and wind speed. Along with these, the other features that are, that are uh, significant are inside and outside carbon monoxide measurements and the speed of the vehicle. The idea of going through this analysis is to, number one, reduce the number of features so that we can reduce training time. And number two, is to avoid overfitting. As part of the model evaluation phase, we do validate if this idea of ours holds good, whether our decision of using PCA was valid or not. So here is the network architecture that we designed for the inside out model. So this design is inspired by the work from a Google team in natural video sequence predictions. Reference to their work is in our paper. So let us decompose uh, this architecture. We have two layers in the network. The top layer has a two-dimensional convolution layer, and the bottom layer is a GRU layer. The input layer provides a tensor in the shape number of features by time window. So the number of features and Time, time window. And this input is provided to both the layers. This two dimensional sensor is similar to a two dimensional image. And the convolutional component in the top layer is used to extract the interdependencies among all the features across the time window, similar to the way 2D convolutional layer captures the spatial layout of an image. To capture the temporal dynamics of these interdependencies, the output of the 2D convolutional element is routed to a GRU element in the recurrent layer. So the bottom layer is simply a GRU network processing multivariate time series data. It captures the temporal structure of the multivariate time, multivariate time series data. The output from the two GRU components are merged followed by a fully connected layer, and finally the output layer emitting the predictions. So as part of the model development, we also optimize the network hyperparameters along with the time window that I mentioned while I discussed the network architecture. We had about 7,000 hyperparameter combinations that we had to iterate over as part of the network optimization exercise. I'm not listing all the parameters that were optimized. They are listed in the paper. And we use grid search algorithm to iterate over all these combinations. We use root mean squared error, error as the accuracy metric. And we also use Pearson and Spearman correlation coefficients to see how well the predicted and the actual values conform with each other. The goal was to minimize the RMSE, the root mean square error, and maximize the correlation coefficients. The Pearson and Spearman correlation coefficients depict two different kinds of relationship between bivariates. So we decided to use both metrics in our evaluation. Ap apologies for a somewhat busy image here, but let me explain what's going on here. This plot shows a subset of our grid search results. Just to make the chart legible, we plot the results where the Pearson coefficient value was greater than or equal to about 0.98. This limits the data that gets included in the chart and makes it legible. So along the x-axis are the grid search iterations with increasing Pearson correlation coefficient values. On the y-axis, we have the root mean square error on the left 
And on the right, we have the correlation coefficients. There are two potential optimal solutions that we can observe. So one here in this region and one here that is marked with this dotted vertical line. Our choice is indicated on the right as, as I'm pointing out here. So we had about 0.99 correlation coefficient value and 0.14 as RMSE. So even though the other candidate had a lower uh, root mean square error value, the correlation, co the correlation coefficients were not good. So the optimized parameters, hyperparameters that we arrived at using the grid search methodology is uh, uh, the, the, the hyperparameters themselves are listed in the paper. I'm not uh, reproducing those uh, in my presentation here. So here are the charts showing the loss curve during model training and the actual versus predicted results. The chart on the left shows the training and validation loss recorded during model training. The x-axis shows the epochs and the y-axis shows the RMSE values. There was no significant improvement observed in the model while training beyond 600 epochs. So the chart on the right shows the prediction performance of the model on the test data. On the x-axis, we have the time steps of the time series data. The y-axis shows the CO value in parts per million. So these are the outside, outside the vehicle CO values. As you can observe, the model performs quite well and the predicted and actual uh, measurements conform well with each other. So we also evaluated the inside out model performance against the other traditional models traditional machine learning models, as well as neural, neural network models popular for their use in regression with multivariate time series data. The charts you see on this slide are the results from this evaluation. The chart on the left shows the root mean square error values for the models under evaluation. So the models are shown along the x-axis and the RMSE is on the y-axis. Only the acronyms are shown along the x-axis. The legend is at the bottom of the screen that gives each, what each acronym stands for. Specifically, IO indicates the inside out model in these charts. The chart on the right shows the corresponding correlation values for each model that, that was evaluated. So from the left chart, we can see that the Huber regressor model has the least RMSE value. However, its correlation values are not good, as you can see on the right side. Even though the RMSE values for inside out model was slightly larger, we have seen very good correlation values. We did other evaluations as well. We evaluated if uh, the use of principal component analysis was justified. We found that the results were good with reduced feature set as a result of PCA. So we also evaluated if a multi-layer perceptron in place of the 2D convolutional element as well as a standalone uh, uh, multi-layer perceptron uh, were evaluated, but the results were not on par with these from the inside out model. I'm not presenting these evaluation results here in my presentation, and I request the audience to please look them up in the paper. So I'm showing the architecture here as part of the ablation study. So as part of this study, the performance of the inside out model is evaluated by removing certain components to understand the contribu contribution of the component to the overall model's performance. So, so in one iteration, we remove the GRU layer, the bottom layer, and test the top layer alone. And in another iteration, we remove the top layer, which includes the 2D convolution layer, and test the bottom layer alone. So the performance of individual layers, as you can see in this table, was, no, was not on par with the combined inside-out model. The results for the inside-out model 
are reproduced here as the third row in this table. Even though the top layer's accuracy was better by four thousandths of um, uh, ppm, the co correlation with inside model was far superior. So this indicates that the neural network design we adopted definitely helps achieve better results in our application. So the key takeaway from this work are it is feasible to convert a personal space monitoring into an effective crowdsourced solution to contribute to the fine-grained pollution measurements. Using the novel architecture of the inside-out model, it is feasible to predict outside CO concentrations based on inside the vehicle CO measurements. And finally, we have shown that the network design that we proposed provides better results as compared to other traditional models. So what are the future research directions and their implications? So we use carbon monoxide measurements to develop our model. There is relevance to include other pollutants as well that we usually encounter and are concerned with. So we use we have used a couple of cars for our uh, data collection. The study should extend to include other car models of varying uh, ages, makes and models as well. So we also believe that the comfort settings inside the car also play an important role uh, in uh, the uh, in the construct of the model. So these future directions imply that we could build a universal model that can seamlessly work across pollutants across car models. If it is relevant, car manufacturers can be incentivized to provide characteristics of the cars that could influence our model performance so that we can have one model that fits all. Thank you.